All right, guys, we are live and we are about to get started here. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started and people can trickle in. Um, so the title of today's lecture is Pediatric Sleep and Breathing Disorders. I'm super excited to be here with you guys today and to talk about uh, what's absolutely my favorite lecture topic. Um, I give a lot of different lectures on TMD and sleep and myofunctional therapy and breathing, but pediatric sleep and breathing disorders uh, truly is my passion and truly is my favorite topic to talk about. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, let's get started. Okay, so um, this is my email address. If anybody has questions after today's presentation or wants any uh, copies of my forms or anything, please email me. I will be in direct communication with you to be able to get these out. Um, so as far as uh, the Zoom webinar etiquette goes, um, obviously everybody is muted. Obviously all of you are um, listening in. So anyone who has questions throughout the um, presentation, I would uh, encourage you to drop any of those into the question and answer box feature uh, located within your Zoom video. So I will be getting to those. I might not get to them during the presentation, but I will absolutely get to them uh, at the end of it where we save some time for some question and answer. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thanks to Karen, who gave an amazing uh, lecture on Tuesday about a plant-based diet and how nutrition and food can help reverse and prevent chronic disease. Um, it's amazing. I always learn so much when I hear uh, her lecture. So thank you so much, Karen. Um, it is truly a blessing to have you a part of the Pain and Sleep Therapy Center for, as a resource to our patients. And I can honestly say uh, from personal experience, uh, you've changed my life and you've continued to change a lot of our patients' lives. So I uh, just wanted to say thank you for that. A um, little bit of housekeeping. Um, here is the 10 part lecture series that we, um, that we have put together for you guys. Uh, obviously, you know, the goal of this is to offer free CE, but also to make you guys more well-rounded, whole health centered providers, whether you're a physician who's logging in today, a dentist, a hygienist, um, whoever it may be. The, the goal here is to get everybody information and education that they, they can use in their practices um, you know, on a, on a daily routine, consistent basis. And then secondly with this, um, Lauren Reinholdt, who was our myofunctional therapist. So she was supposed to be giving about half of the lecture today. Now she's still on here as a panelist and she'll be chiming in here from time to time and especially at the end. Um, but I wanted to make a call to action. We've decided on Thursday, May 7th, we have titled that lecture airway and myofunctional disorders within the dental practice. We are going to make that completely myofunctional therapy um, within the dental office. And so myofunctional therapy is airway related. So that is going to be pretty much Lauren's um, whole entire uh, presentation on Thursday, May the 7th. So I would uh, encourage anyone who's interested in myofunctional therapy to tune into that. Lauren will be going into what myofunctional therapy is, how you can screen for it, how it's used within the dental office, and then of course some uh, cases in, in order to kind of show you how they can um, improve someone's life. Um, so, you know, for those of you who don't know me, I'm sure some of you have heard me speak before, but for those of you who don't know me, um, so uh, I am credentialed with the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, the American Board of Craniofacial Dental Sleep Medicine, the American Board of Craniofacial Pain, and the International Association of Oral Facial Myology. And so, uh, as I like to tell everybody, my education started after I graduated dental school, 
about 100% of the things that I practice on a daily basis I've learned after I graduated from dental school. So um, I'm very fortunate to have had a nice base with um, you know, my high school and my college education, and even my dental school. But I really can say that uh, my true um, practical learning and practical application of education um, has come after dental school. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I've basically devoted my entire career to study this stuff. And now to be able to, um, you know, practice this 100% of the time is uh, a dream come true to me. And so this is Lauren Reinholdt. Um, she is a former hygienist and she pre now practices oral facial myofunctional therapy within our office. Um, she's great. I work with her on pretty much every single case. Um, you know, side by side. So she is uh, a great resource for me to have in my office. Um, just wanted to give a quick shout out to Dr. Joanna Green. She runs the infant tongue tie program within the pain and sleep therapy center. Dr. Joanna just had her third child um, a few days ago. And so she is now at home recovering. Um, and so I've been seeing a lot of the infants uh, on her behalf um, the last month or so, and I'm going to continue to do that until she's back in action. But uh, she's an amazing resource as well. I think she runs, uh, quite frankly, the best infant tongue tie program in the whole entire country, uh, hands down, bar none, to anybody else. Uh, so we're uh, it's very fortunate to have her at the, at the office. Um, the whole entire team, obviously, you guys have known, if you've heard me speak before, you know, we're nothing without this team that we have surrounded ourselves with. These girls are extremely compassionate. They're extremely dedicated. They come to work ready to make a big difference every single day, every single one of them. A lot of these girls have been with me 10 years, um, uh, very long-term employees that have kind of seen me grow in my airway education and be able to kind of deliver the services that we do now. Um, and so at the Pain and Sleep Therapy Center, we're an airway-focused integrative center for health and wellness. Uh, our mission is we provide hope and we enhance the quality of life for adults and children by finding the root cause of a person's problem. And our goals are to improve sleep, increase energy, alleviate pain. And what we're going to talk about today is promoting proper growth and development. That'll be one part of what we talk about today. And to remind everybody, we do spend 100% of our time treating craniofacial pain and dental sleep medicine within our office. We do not do any dentistry. We've gotten out of that. Um, and uh, we do spend 100% of our time treating these uh, people who need, who need our help the most. Um, we do a ton of services there, obviously a lot of airway. Um, I gave a lecture last week on TMD, so hopefully a lot of you guys learned about that and the relationship of TMD and headaches, airway, bruxism, grinding of the teeth, all that. Obviously, we have our myofunctional therapy program um, run by Lauren Reinholdt. We have our um, infant tongue tie program run by Dr. Joanna Green, and then we have the adult tongue tie program run by me. Um, and so, you know, what we say, all these services, how they're all related, well, they all have to do with breathing. And so hopefully listening to me speak um, after many of these webinars, a lot of people are starting to think more about breathing and start to think more about the root cause and what's beyond the teeth. Um, so a little update here in the Robinson household. So it's been a fun week, uh, you know, a lot of walks, a lot of, um, a lot of time with the kids outdoors, even though it's been a little bit chillier this past week here um, in Delaware. Um, one of the biggest accomplishments um, we had during this quarantine was we, we finally got our basketball hoop up and installed. And so that's my little guy, Bryce, right there working on his jumper. And this is um, uh, perfect timing with the Michael Jordan, The Last Dance documentary coming out on Sunday, which I'm a huge fan of Michael Jordan. So uh, to tune in and watch that and then to put it on replay the next day to let my son watch. Uh, pretty cool. So we're out there, you know, shooting jumpers until uh, until it gets dark. Um, so that's been a kind of a good way to occupy our time while we're, um, while we're on quarantine. Um, and so uh, as, as fun as they all are, um, please first offer is they're yours. These, these kids are driving us literally crazy and we can't wait for school to start again. Um, so now all jokes aside, um, you know, the kids, the kids have been, um, a lot of fun to be around and, uh, the message here at the, at our household is always be happy and, you know, find joy. Um, so I tell people, uh, you know, I'm living my dream. I'm, I'm practicing, you know, uh, something that I only thought was a dream when I, when I became a dentist. And so I help people breathe better in order to optimize their health and wellness. So I'm very proud of what I do. And, and it's even more uh, refreshing to be in front of all of you today and be able to um, offer such um, uh, a look into breathing uh, and now from a, a pediatric standpoint. So um, 
at the office, we've been doing a lot of telehealth virtual appointments. And so if you guys haven't gotten on board with this yet, this is a great way to see your patients on video without having to see them in the office. So I'd highly encourage you to look into that. We use a program called doxy.me for all of our virtual uh, appointments. And that's been very helpful and has completely changed the way that we're able to um, reach our patients. So that's been great. So all of you guys know, um, I think the medical system that we live in today is broken. I think that there's a lot of providers out there who are doing their part in being able to treat people's health and not just the medicine of sick care, what disease, what pill, but we're starting to transition into more of uh, a pursuit of optimal health and wellness. And so I think one of the people that get unnoticed quite frequently is our kids. And our kids are ones that need the, our attention the most. And so we have a big, huge emphasis in our office about you know the way that kids need to be be treated and the um, and basically the, uh, the the opportunity that's at our at, at our hands uh, every day to be able to kind of uh, prevent things and not treat people once they're sick. So you guys know I preach this every single day: sleep, nutrition, movement of the body, and and mental health. And so that's the pillars of our of of what I think is optimal health and wellness. And so we want to breathe deeply. We want to hydrate often, think positive, move daily. We want to eat smart. We want to sleep like a baby. And hopefully that, that right there, sleep like a baby, hopefully that I'll give that a new kind of meaning today. So sleeping like a baby can be good if the baby's sleeping well. If the baby's not sleeping well, we don't want to sleep like a baby. So um, let's go ahead and kind of jump in here. So why do I do this? Well, you know, I've had, uh, I have two kids, uh, a soon to be five-year-old and a soon to be three-year-old. And so both of these guys have had some serious kind of breathing problems um, from the moments that they were, uh, you know, infants. And so we've, we've had our fair share of stay, stays at the uh, Nemours Pediatric um, Hospital here in Delaware. And uh, it's not fun. It's not fun watching your kid hooked up to oxygen. It's not fun watching your kid take breaths at uh, 70 five breaths per minute. I mean, that's a very scary thing. So I can honestly say I truly appreciated breathing, you know, since I started educating myself on all this, but it wasn't until about five years ago where I really put the emphasis on being able to learn more about the pediatric population and what we can do to help them. So um, here's a little video of my guy. And of course, my daughter as well. So that's pretty scary stuff. And, and uh, you know, even when you get them out of the hospital and you're they're on these, um, you know, nebulizers and albuterol inhalers and, you know, you're just pumping steroids through these, these kids, um, you know, fragile systems in order to get them to just breathe. You know, the most, the most um, kind of under under recognized uh, condition that's out there is breathing. And so um, this really helped me kind of devote a lot of my time to spending more time learning about the pediatric population, what I can do um, with the education that I have with adults, what I can do to help these kids out. Um, so what is the role of the dentist in sleep and breathing? And notice we don't, we don't necessarily put sleep breathing together anymore. We say sleep and breathing. We really help people with their sleep breathing at nighttime, but we help a lot of people in our center with their breathing during the day as well, because a lot of these patients um, have a breathing problem during the day, and that's kind of what we'll look at today as well. So, you know, fortunately for us in the airway world, the ADA finally published um, the role of dentistry in the, in the treatment of sleep-related breathing disorders in 2017. Um, and so, you know, the, it was very important for a lot of the, us people that have been in the airway world for a long time. And it, and it basically, you can read all this. I mean, I can send you guys this, but it basically says dentists play an essential role in the multidisciplinary care of patients with sleep-related breathing disorders. Um, now so more than ever, right? We are the the ones, we are the front lines. Our hygienists spend anywhere from 40 to 60 to 90 minutes with these patients every six months. You know, now is the time to roll out your screening forms. Now is the time to recognize disorders that you never thought you could recognize because you were labeled as a dentist or a hygienist. You are in position to make a huge impact on your patient's lives. So let's step up and let's do it. Okay, so dentists are encouraged to screen and recognize symptoms such as daytime sleepiness, snoring, evaluate risk factors such as obesity, retronathia, hypertension, and refer to a knowledgeable provider. All children should be screened for sleep-related breathing disorders through history, clinical examinations to identify the signs and symptoms for deficient growth and development. Dentists are the appropriate providers to develop an optimal physiologic airway and breathing pattern. It makes a lot of sense, guys. We're in such a good position. And like I said, for all of us who've been doing this for a long time, we're like, thank God. It only took us till 2017 to realize that breathing is important. 
No way. That's crazy. We landed on the moon. <clears throat> so, you know, let's not be late to the party. Let's not be let's not be too late. So I've I've made my career with with these people here in their middle to late age i i've done i put out a lot of fires in my career and i and i and i treat a lot of fires still currently to this day but i keep asking myself should i wait for a fire or should i put it out before the before the the fire starts should i put it out when there's smoke and so that's what we're going to talk about today we're going to talk about recognizing you know even our littlest of patients our, our six month olds you know right out right off the bat when these babies are born that we see in our center for for lip and tongue ties right we want to if we have friends that are just um have babies and there's problems let's start making ourselves knowledgeable as providers let's make ourselves knowledgeable let's let's identify the smoke so that we never have to put a fire out so for airway disorders so for adults we have to realize the expectations here for adults we can only really manage their symptoms it's very very hard to cure an adult yeah we have a lot of orthopedic dental expansion and stuff that we do now and sometimes you know we can take a person who has a, a problem and we can cure them but it's very hard for for the for 99 percent of adults we're basically managing their fire we're just keeping it a low-grade fire so that it doesn't end up killing them or end up giving them cardiovascular disease or end up creating some sort of morbidity that completely affects the quality of their life but children are different guys children we can cure we can prevent we can prevent a lifetime of issues and that's what we're going to learn about today and so as you guys have probably saw on if you guys tuned in the last thursday the link between tmd bruxism and sleep apnea you know there's really three patients that we see and and it's hard to kind of generalize and, and categorize these patients that we see but but that's what we do okay and so the fat old man that is one that is very very easy to to diagnose and to identify. These are the ones that come in, they're overweight, they're neck size, they have health issues, they have comorbidities. I mean, you name it, they're the ones that are falling asleep after a turkey dinner on Thanksgiving. Uh, they're the ones that say that everything's okay. Um, so those are the ones that are easy to recognize, right? And so then we have these young fit females and these are the ones that we do best with as dentists. These are the ones that we, sleep, we see in my um, pain and sleep uh, therapy center every single day. These are the people that usually go undiagnosed. These are the people that have headaches. These are the people that have anxiety, depression. They might have um, an upregulation of their sympathetic nerves, nerve system. These are the patients that present to me with jaw pain. These are the patients that present to me with the TMD diagnosis that I have to fix, right? So that's our second category. And our third category is Yes, the pediatric, the pediatric portion of our practices, the pediatrics that are out there, it's all about the kids. We can cure and prevent them. So here's, here's my two little guys in the hot tub. We, we opened up the hot tub this past week as well. So they've been having a ball in there. Um, but it's all about the kids. And that's, and that's the third you know, demographic that we're going we're gonna to look at today and, and figure out you know, what can we do? What can we do to identify them and possibly treat them and save their, li their life? So to kind of framework this out, um, I'd like to call on some statistics here. So did you know that more than half of American children have a diagnosed chronic illness? Like that's absolutely crazy, right? So let's look at some statistics. Rates of autism have risen over the past few decades from one in 10,000 to one in 50. Autism treatment costs the U.S. $268 billion per year and is expected to reach a trillion by 2025. Asthma affects one in eight children. You know, my kids were there. My kids had asthma. I'm going to tell you how we, how we treated them and how we, we, my kids haven't had an asthma attack in, since they were uh, one and a half years old. I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you how I was able to treat my kids. One in three U.S. children are overweight or obese. That's crazy. That's so sad. One in 30 U.S. children are diagnosed with depression. Guys, our kids are depressed. What is going on? These kids are like the, the canaries in the coal mine, right? You know, there's a, I love that story of, the, of the, the fact that these coal miners used to, back in the day, bring these canaries down into these coal mines. And basically, as soon as the canary dropped dead, that's when the coal miners knew that they had to get the heck out of the coal mine because, um, because the breathing wasn't safe, right? And so our kids, we're looking at these kids that are trying to develop, and, and our kids are not the same as they used to be. There's a lot more issues going on today, and we're here to, to be able to identify them and put them on the right path, right? 
10% of U.S. children have a diagnosis of ADD and ADHD, and 17% of children are labeled as having a learning disability. ADHD is estimated to cost the U.S. over $100 billion per year, right? These are staggering numbers. These are putting a major stress on our healthcare system. We're spending so much money these days. So let's talk about what does sleep have to do with my child's health and wellness? Well, you guys should know sleep is for development. It's the, reason, it's the reason why babies sleep all the time. And as we get older and older and older, we require a little bit less sleep until we finally level off at about eight hours of sleep that we absolutely need, right? And so development happens when you're sleeping. And I'm going to go into this in just a second. But um, the primary activity of the brain takes over when people are sleeping, right? And the sleep-wake cycle is regulated by these light and dark system, um, dark uh, uh, rhythms called the circadian rhythms. And so that's why we see a lot of kind of irregularities with our newborns. Um, they have their schedules backwards. It's not until about, you know, uh, six weeks, three months, six, some for, for my kids. And I think it took to about six to nine months in order for them to finally start sleeping through the, the gosh darn night. Um, but, you know, we all kind of figure it out and, and light is what regulates our sleep cycles and our circadian rhythms and our biologic clocks. They're the ones that tell us when we get sleepy by raising the melatonin and dropping the dopamine, right? So by age uh, two, most children have spent more time asleep than they have awake. Overall, a child will spend 40% of his or her childhood asleep. Sleep is especially important for children because they're developing not just physically, mentally as well. All those neurocognitive things that need to happen as a baby is developing happen during sleep, guys. All right, so we have two stages of sleep. We have the non-REM sleep, which is what we label a quiet sleep, right? That's kind of body healing and body um, restoration. Then we have the REM sleep or the active sleep where our minds go crazy trying to organize our thoughts and store them into long-term database, databases of memories and um, you know the uh, moods. And, and there's many things that are regulated in REM sleep. So I'm not going to go too much into this because I went into this a little bit last time. And you know if you guys are really interested in learning more about airway and sleep, you know, I do give a ton of courses um, that are available for you to kind of learn just about the airway. But, you know, today is about the pediatrics. So that's what we're going to focus on. So I want to make a call to action. Stage three, this is the N3. So if we have N1, N2, N3 and REM sleep, stage three is extremely important, guys, especially for kids. Stage three is where we're able to regulate and secrete a hormone called human growth hormone. This is directly responsible for development. Okay. Most important level of sleep for the kids is this N3 sleep. Have you guys ever noticed if you have kids that, you know, unlike any other population with a kid, when they're knocked out, you can go in their room, you can turn on their light, you can um, turn the water on, you can clean up their room and they're not going to wake up. And the reason is, is because if they're in good deep sleep, they are basically unresponsive to the outside environment. You literally have to shake a kid to get them out of, out of sleep. Don't do it because obviously that's the most important stage of sleep. But if your kid, if you're noticing your kid is restless and tossing and turning a lot, you're, you probably need to be suspicious that they're not getting good N3 sleep. They're probably getting a lot of junk food sleep, as we like to call it. They're probably getting a lot of this stage two, this very light sleep. That junk food, that junk food sleep, that, as we like to call it, um, and that's a problem, right? So if your kids are tossing and turning, ended up in different positions, the the covers are all pushed around, and they're doing that quite frequently, that's a red flag. Okay, so how much sleep do we need? I just talked about this. We need a ton when we're babies, and we need about eight hours as we grow up. Okay, but always, 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 we cannot get away with lower than seven hours of sleep. People can get away with it, but realize there are irreversible effects that are, that are happening if you have less than seven hours of sleep. There's not even 0.5% of the population that can get away with, with five hours of sleep um, or less, uh, I should say six hours of sleep or less uh, on a daily basis without having some sort of chronic disease that starts, that starts forming. Okay, so what happens if there's something preventing us from getting good sleep, okay? What happens if there is something in the way of us being able to sleep? Well, with pediatric OSA, some of them are very easy to identify, some of them are very hard. So let's look at one that's very easy to identify. Sorry, guys. There goes a deep breath again. That was a clear breath. And now again, he's going to start holding it. 
all of these breaths that he's taking right now, he's not really getting much into his lungs. There he goes. <clears throat> so that's pretty easy to identify. Obviously, if you see a kid that has that going on, I mean, that is um, about the easiest one to recognize. Um, so hopefully if anybody has seen any of their kids sleep and has seen these choking spells, um, you've already gotten your kid help. But here's one that's a little bit less kind of easy to identify. Let's take a peek at her. There it is. That's the choke. That's the lack of airflow. So I don't know if you guys were able to see that, but you can uh, definitely tell the interruptions that are happening with the breathing there and the interruptions basically of the arousals where she basically has to reset her jaw and reset her breathing. And these are the ones that typically will go into a polysomnogram inside a, um, inside a lab and they will typically come back with no sleep apnea, right? But although we know their arousal index is, is through the roof, right? Their brains are being so protective of their airway, their brains aren't possibly gonna let them to not stop breathing for more than 10 seconds. And remember guys, sleep apnea is a condition where you stop breathing for more than 10 seconds. So what if you only stop breathing for seven seconds? What if you only stop breathing for seven, for nine seconds, right? And we, and we have our brains are very active. We have that sympathetic upregulation and our brains are arousing us, causing us to reset ourselves and reset our breathing. But every single time we have an arousal, we go from transitioning into deep sleep to transitioning back into light sleep. So a lot of these kids that have this these arousals, they have this junk food sleep. They have this uh, N2 light sleep, this phase two sleep. So let's talk a little bit more about OSA. I'm not going to, I'm not going to concentrate too heavily on this, but I do got kind of want to make you guys aware of um, some of the classifications that are out there. So unlike adults, children are different. Okay. So with adults, the majority of my patients, we do home sleep tests nowadays. I mean, I'm talking 97, 98% of our, of our adults, we do testing in, in, in the comfort of their own home. And so remember any, any amount of event of events per hour of stopping breathing for more than 10 seconds, if it's below five, that is considered normal. If it's above five, between five and 15, it's mild. If it's 15 to 30 events per hour, it's moderate. If it's over 30 events per hour, it's severe. Now with our children, that is not the case. With our children, we have a different set of scoring. Okay, so with our children, we have any, any event where the child stops breathing for more than 10 seconds. If there's one, if there's a one and a half of those per hour to five, that's mild. Anything five to 10 is moderate and anything above 10 is severe obstructive sleep apnea. Okay. And then ages 13 to 17, we have a lot of variability. They're still trying to figure out this. My sleep physicians kind of are on the fence about this too. Some of my sleep physicians send these 13 year olds in to get a PSG. Some of my sleep physicians, um, allow us to dispense HSTs um, to a 12 year old and, and have them do it at home as well. Um, so that's kind of up to the kind of, uh, decision of your sleep physician, whoever you're working with in your community. Um, so, um, all right, so let's move on. <clears throat> and I, well, let me first, before I move on, let me just say how tough it is to get a polysomnogram at our local hospitals here, whether it be Christiana and the Moors, um, any of the local kind of sleep centers, it's very, very difficult to get our child, our children booked. I've been trying to get my kids a sleep study for a long time, and it's very, very difficult. You have to go through all these screening um, metrics, they cost a ton of money. And then you finally do get your kid into a sleep study and the tech has to hook up, you know, 18 leads, at least 12 leads and more so like 30 leads all over this kid's face, head, neck, body, thorax, like you name it, their legs because we're looking for periodic limb movement. And then we ask the kid to go to sleep. Like how, you know, how reasonable is that? You have a, a four-year-old who you're suspecting a sleep problem with, and then you put them into a foreign lab. You have people looking at them through a window and you put all these leads on them. Then you tell them to go to sleep. So, you know, you, a lot of times with these polysomnograms, 
you don't get the quality of, of data that you're looking for. And so a whole nother topic, a whole nother day, we can, which we can get into later. But I wanted to first call out the godfather of sleep medicine. He is a personal friend of mine or was a personal friend of mine. And I've learned so much from him over the course of many, many years. This is Christian Gimeno. Um, I call him the goat. Uh, a lot of us airway guys all call him the goat, the greatest of all time. And so uh, CG, as, as we call him, um, he is responsible for the whole um, discovery of sleep apnea. So back in like 1976, he started researching this stuff. And then 1978, it became mm -hmm. official. But he is one of the godfathers of sleep medicine. Now, he is the one that gave us the classifications of oxygen desaturations, of apnea, hypopnea index. And I'm about to tell you a story about him in just a second. Um, but let me tell you this. CG devoted the last 10 to 15 years of his life to pediatric sleep breathing disorders alone because he saw from 1976 up until about you know 2000, uh, 2005, where he basically was helping adults and getting a lot of information. But then he really turned his attention to being able to help out the kids. And, and for that, we are so gracious to be able to stand on the shoulders of a giant like him. He absolutely is a giant and he has influenced my career in so many ways. So here's uh, myself and then Dr. Eric Phelps is over there on the left. He's an orthodontist in San Jose, California. One of my good uh, friends who's an airway orthodontist. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, uh, Eric Phelps and I were down in Marco Island last February at the American Academy of Orthodontics, and he, um, CG, spoke at the at the conference, and he got a standing ovation. It was amazing because, as you guys are probably aware, orthodontists are probably in the best position to be able to kind of help out with pediatric sleep breathing disorders um, from an orthopedic development standpoint. And so he gave a, a profound lecture, uh, could barely hold himself up, gave a profound lecture to, you know, a group of uh, a thousand of us um, uh, orthodontists that were in the room. And, and so um, we gave him a standing ovation and that was extremely powerful to, for me to see. A few months later, he actually passed away. And so um, rest in peace, CG. But uh, he is, without him, we would not be able to have the understanding that we do of the airway. So um, Here's one of his uh, publications, and he is very, very published. I want, if you guys want to learn more about pediatrics, if you want to learn more about sleep breathing disorders, just type in Christian Gimeno. He will, he will, he has more research to keep you busy for the whole entire quarantine if you started now until we were able to go back into our offices. And so, you know, one of the papers that he published here, Pediatric Obstructive Sleep Apnea. So like I told you, C CG was responsible for the whole AHI thing. And, you know, talking to him many years, he always says his biggest downfall was putting such heavy emphasis on the use of an AHI as a metric to be able to grade people for health versus not health. And so he would say, I mean, through all the amazing things that he did through his career, he would say his biggest downfall is using AHI as an index for grading um, sleep breathing disorders. And so, um, because he says it's not just about the AHI, it's not just about OSA. And so he said, if we're looking just at AHI, we're going to, we're going to miss the miss a vast majority of our sleep related breathing disorders, right? So the use of the apnea hypopnea index was created one part of a scoring system, just one. Unfortunately, that is the part that, uh, insurance companies latched onto and they use that to judge people for breathing health. And that's a shame. So what is it about? So for us guys in the airway who look, who work with our pediatric population, well, it's about a lot of things. It's about oxygen saturation, right? That's one of the most important things. Are, are people's oxygen dropping low? I mean, like I told you before in uh, last Thursday's lecture is I see people into the sixties at night, you know, you should be at 95 or higher throughout daytime, nighttime, throughout your whole entire life. You should never drop below 95% oxygen. That's just not healthy. Um, flow limitations. Is there any airflow limitations? We're going to talk a lot about that. Arousals. As you saw in that second video of pediatric uh, sleep breathing disorder uh, video that I showed you, that little girl was having an arousal. That little girl was being brought from out of deep sleep into light sleep, into that junk food sleep. Respiratory disturbances. Respiratory effort related arousals. So if you work with a really good sleep physician and you partner up with your local hospitals and you have these one-on-one -on -one relationships um, with these guys that you can call on the phone and say, hey, you know, I have, you know, Bryce, Bryce Robinson coming in. You know, I want, I want you to, to not just give me an AHI, but I, I really want you to be able to determine how many arousals he's having, how many flow limitations is he having. And you can work with your sleep physicians in order to get these custom reports that are made for you. And you might not necessarily get a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. What you will get is a 
idea, a better understanding of what happens when this child is trying to breathe, right? Is your kid sleep on her, their stomach? Is their butt up in the air? That's a major red flag. How much time is being spent in the different sleep stages? One of the main things that I get that always confuses me is I get a, um, a sleep study from one of my sleep physicians and they say normal, right? So it's, it's below five or for a kid, it's below one. But I look at the sleep stages, I'm like, this, this kid spent 85% of, of the night in N2, in, in junk food sleep. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And like, well, it's not, it's not obstructive sleep apnea. Okay. So that's up to me. I have to, I have to figure that out. I have to figure out how to get that kid into N3. I have to figure out how to get that release of the human growth hormone. I have to figure out how to get our kids developing properly. Right. And so understanding the pathophysiology of breathing, we talked about this last time, nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. There's a huge difference. Diaphragmatic breathing from your belly versus the shallow sympathetic chest breathing. There's a big difference guys. Okay. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all this, but what we really need to know is if we don't treat our pediatric population for their sleep and breathing disorders, it can adversely impact their child's, a child's physical and neurologic development that can lead to issues with social functioning, academic success, athletic su success, overall well-being. Okay. So one of the questions we get at our practice all the time, whether it's any of the hygienists that we work with um, in our center, even how do I know if my child has a problem? Well, there's a lot of misperceptions that are out there and there's a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation that's out there. And the point of my lecture today, and I strategically position my slides to be able to, to address all seven of these top common misperceptions that are out there. So let's go through them one by one. And I hope that you'll see that if you stay on for the whole time, I will address every single one of these and provide um, profound research that is, that is behind these things to be able to prove why this is incorrect. So number one, snoring is normal. Absolutely not. Snoring is not normal. Number two, grinding of the baby teeth is okay and will, and will go away once the permanent teeth come in. False. Tonsils and adenoids will never need to be taken out. False. ADHD is a condition that can only be treated by medication. Mouth breathing is normal. And so what, one of the common phrases that we use at my um, sleep center is we say, uh, just because it's common does not mean it's normal. Just because we see it a lot does not mean it's healthy, okay? Bed wetting is from too many liquids before bedtime. Genetics is the reason to blame for my child's growth, behavior, learning. You wouldn't believe how many parents we talk to in our practice. Oh, I had the same problem. His dad has the problem. It's his dad's fault. Well, I mean, our genetics play a role 100%, but we can influence our genetics. We can suppress some of our genes that we don't want to come out. We can enhance. We can up, up. Uh, regulate some of our genes that we do want to come out. So we have genetics, but we also have epigenetics. We have our environmental influence on the genetics that we are, um, that we are born with. So we're going to learn about that. Okay. So here's one from the American Academy of Pediatrics, right? This is not us dentists talking. This is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And this is on the diet. This is a practice guideline. Okay. This is on the diagnosis and the management of childhood obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. The following recommendations are made. All children or adolescents should be screened for snoring, right? How do we screen? We have to get our, our forms. We have to get our paper forms. When a parent walks into your office, please make them fill out that paper form. I'm going to give you these things that you can use in your practice tomorrow if you open up or three months from now if it takes that long to open up. You guys are going to have the tools necessary to be able to screen for these things and do what we're supposed to be doing as providers, okay? So... American Academy of Pediatrics, they're getting on board. Their governing bodies are getting on board. They're finally realizing snoring is not normal in a child. Children who snore should be screened for an airway issue. Children who snore should have a comprehensive examination. Children who snore should have a polysomnogram to rule out sleep apnea. I mean, I know we're still talking about sleep apnea, and that's, but we, we have to be okay with that for now. We'll eventually, 10 years from now, we won't be just talking about sleep apnea. And we'll have new guidelines that are available to talk about flow limitation and arousals. And we'll be able to recognize kids who maybe fly under the radar to need help. But at least for now, the American Academy of Pediatrics, they're getting on board. They're, they're realizing snoring is not normal. Okay, so what are some of the signs and symptoms that we see on a daily basis? 
So let's talk about these. So we have nighttime symptoms and we have daytime symptoms. Nighttime symptoms are ones that you're gonna have to go inside your child's room. You're gonna have to look for these things, okay? These, the child is not gonna wake up and say, hey, I had my mouth open all night. Hey, mom and dad, I, I had a lot of frequent awakenings. Hey, it took me a while to get to sleep last night. Hey, I was grinding my teeth. No, that's not what they're gonna say. We have to look for these things, right? Snoring, mouth open. Go check on your kids three times a night. Go in at, at 10 o'clock. Go in at one o'clock, go in at five o'clock in the morning. Make sure those kids' lips are closed. We do not wanna see open mouth. We do not wanna see this. That is the first sign, okay? Um, teeth grinding, drooling, sweating. Do any of your kids sweat at nighttime? That is a problem. That is, means they are not regulating their hormones correctly. Their internal body temperature should drop low at nighttime. All right, bedwetting, that is a huge one that we talk about in our practice all the time. Sleep talking, sleep walking, nightmares. Um, tossing and turning like I was talking about, uh, restless leg syndrome, kicking of the legs. Um, we have so many parents in our, in our practice that come in and say, my kid sleeps with me um, and it's hard. I wake up a lot because my kid is always kicking me. Okay, so like I, like I talk about in the public, you know, one thing you need to do if you wanna get a good night's sleep is you need to figure out your kids first. You don't want your kids walking around at nighttime. You don't want your kids in bed with you snoring. You don't want kids, your kids in bed with you kicking their legs. Okay, difficulty waking up in the morning. That's a, that's a major red flag. Okay, so bedwetting, that is one of the ones that we will talk about a lot. All right, daytime symptoms of sleep breathing disorders in children. These are things that are happening during the day. Mouth breathing, dry mouth upon wakening, bad breath, right? Any of your kids have bad breath in the morning? That's a sign that they had their mouth open. Trouble getting out of bed, morning headaches, sleepiness, depression, behavioral problems. Here's ones that we see all the times in, a, in the kids that we, that we treat. Aggressive, irritable, poor concentration, difficulty being able to learn, academic performance not being as good as you think it should be, this ADHD pattern. Let's talk more about that. So what we do is we send our parents, all of our parents in all of our dental practices, go home with what's called a private eye home study. And regardless if the parent wants to hear this or not, we say, hey, you have a child, you should read this and you should start observing your child to make sure that there's nothing going on that needs further evaluation. And we give this out. And so if any of you guys were a part of my lecture last Thursday, I think you got this in your emails. Um, if you guys want a, another copy of this, feel free, email me, we'll send this out. I am, I am very um, open and I'm very um, um, uh, generous with my forms. I have made a lot of these forms, but these forms are for you guys. These forms are so that we can treat the masses. These forms are so that, you know, just in my practice, we're not doing this. This should be stuff that we're doing everyone's practice. Okay, so this is an observation guideline that allows parents to watch their kids and notice for signs of problems. So a friend of mine and a colleague, so Dr. Darius Lagmani, he's uh, notorious for wearing these bow ties and he's coming to Philadelphia, um, uh, which was gonna be this November, but it's actually gonna be April now for the Pediatric Airway Symposium. So I can't wait for all of you guys to meet him um, in Philadelphia for our Pediatric Airway Symposium. But um, he's a friend and a colleague of mine. And so he has a, he, he's a MD, he's a physician. He works for Advocate Children's Hospital in Chicago. And so he's, um, here, here's, here's what he says. What are the top three signs of sleepiness in children? And it's one, inattentiveness, two, hyperactivity, and three, poor temper. You know, I know I grade my kids on this stuff all the time. So the top three signs of sleepiness in children, would you have thought that? Inattentiveness, hyperactivity, poor temper. I mean, Dr. Lagmani has years and years and years of research in this, in this category. So what does he say? What are the top three signs of ADHD? Well, they tend to be the exact same. Inattentiveness, hyperactivity, poor temper, right? So, you know, this topic is uh, becoming a little bit hotter um, as of the last five years. And so, you know, we're now starting to get some uh, questions to whether or not we're diagnosing the wrong condition. So if you read this, this is published in the New York Times. Experts say that between one and 3% of our children have sleep apnea, which I think is completely wrong. I think it's way higher than that. And if, and if at least they don't have sleep apnea, I know they have a lot, a lot um, more uh, mild conditions like sleep, a sleep related breathing disorder and maybe not sleep apnea, um, but that can disrupt far more than a family's restful night. Affected children can simply do not get enough restorative sleep to assure normal development. Uh, the condition can result in hyperactivity and kids are often mistaken for ADHD and they're given a stimulant, right? Kids can't sleep at nighttime, so they're not getting proper rest. And then maybe a physician comes in and gives them a stimulant. 
right? We're not treating the root cause. We're just making them even more hyperactive. We're making them even more um, sleep deprived because these stimulants um, I'm going to show you are, are things that are preventing our kids from dropping down into deep sleep. You know, we don't want to medicate our, our kids without um, ruling out a sleep problem first, without ruling out a breathing problem first, right? So maybe we're diagnosing the wrong uh, condition. And I'm not saying that ADHD doesn't exist. It absolutely does. I'm just saying in my particular case, in my practice, when a mom comes to me and says, here are, are the signs that I'm noticing at home and I'm noticing signs and symptoms, I'm way less likely to put them on a drug than I am to, to uh, evaluate their sleeping first. Okay, so how can you tell the difference? Well, I don't know. You tell me. I mean, the, the way that I tell the difference is I get a sleep study. I ask my sleep physician to tell me if there's any arousals. I ask mom and dad to go in the room and, and show me video of the child sleeping. I ask mom and dad to, to ob observe behavior during the day. I ask my moms and dad to, to look for open mouth. I ask them to look for mouth breathing. Okay, there's a lot of things that I do um, to, to distinguish between ADHD and sleep apnea in my practice. So coming from the Journal of Sleep, this is back in 2013. So the odds of having behavioral problems were six times higher in children who had persistent sleep apnea. Children with persistent apnea were seven times more likely to have um, learning problems. Okay, so ADHD, sleep, we have to, we, the two are one in the same. Let's rule out a breathing problem before we start putting our kids on medications. So what is the new treatment for ADHD? Well, in my practice, if you're the right candidate, it's sleep and oxygen. Sleep and oxygen is the new Ritalin, right? So what do we know about the research? Well, there's a ton of research out here, guys, and there's becoming more and more of this. We know that sleep disorder breathing and ADHD are associated. We know that 40% of children with ADHD have sleep apnea. The two are one in the same. They're comorbid. If you heard me talk last Thursday on TMD and bruxism and sleep apnea, you know how comorbid those things are. Let's start looking at our kids. Let's, let's stop giving them medications right off the bat. Let's start, let's start looking at breathing. Okay. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? Hopefully you guys are all starting to make some connections here, right? So what role can, can a dentist play? I know a lot of us on here today are dentists and a lot of us on here today are physicians and hygienists. Well, what role can um, we play as a dentist? Um, well, for, for me and for all of my practices, we do a pediatric airway screening. We ask mom and dad to answer these questions. They are given a clipboard and they are given this every six months they come in. We want to know. We want to know what they know. And a lot of times this column out here don't know that moms, moms and dads check that or they check no. That's okay. We're, we're at least getting them thinking. And so I'm not going to go through our pediatric airway questionnaire, and I realized I gave this to one of my local orthodontic uh, orthodontists, and he just he just poo pooed it. He said, he said, Ryan, this is fantastic, um, and this is a great way to screen. He goes, we, my parents don't, my parents in my practice don't have enough time to do this. So if you want something that's a little bit less, well, we've come up with that too. So here's some of the questions that I ask. I'm going to kind of run through these real quick, but take a look at this. This is my good friend, Jerry Simmons. He is out of Texas, right? He is on a task force to start screening children for airway. And here's five questions. Here's, here's five questions. Can you guys all commit to at least using this? I don't, I don't need you to use mine. I mean, I know mine is long. Um, maybe you can, maybe I'll use mine if you guys refer me a patient and we can kind of get into more of the underlying issues, but can you guys at least start using this? Right? Let's, let's start screening our children, our practices, whether you're a physician, a hygienist, a dentist. Come on, guys. Let's get on board with screening our children for breathing problems. And so here's five questions. So I'm, I'm going to send this out to all of you guys, whether you like it or not. And I'm hoping that you'll use it day one, back from corona quarantine. Okay? So let's talk about bedwetting. Okay, this is, a, this is a thing that we talk about all the time. The kids are embarrassed by it. Sometimes the adults are embarrassed by it. But typically when we go one-on-one, -on -one, we close the door and we have a conversation with mom. Mom usually will say, hey, my kid's six years old and still wetting the bed. And Lauren and I look at each other and we go, she needs to be educated. Lauren and I look at each other and go, she doesn't know why. And it's our job to tell her. Because if we don't tell her, you know what she's going to do? She's going to go to Dr. Google. And what is Dr. Google going to tell her? Dr. Google is going to tell her it's okay, and here's what we can do. 
The Malum Ultimate is our most popular bedwetting alarm, and we're proud to say it was selected to be used for clinical bedwetting research and has even appeared on the Today Show. It's everything you need in one compact and lightweight alarm. It boasts unsurpassed durability and the loudest sound with strongest steady vibration, specially designed for deep sleeping children. To get started, your child can attach the easy clip sensor to the front of his own close fitting underwear and then clip the alarm to his shirt. At the first sign of wetness, the alarm will sound and or vibrate. To stop the alarm, unclip the sensor and push the reset button. <clears throat> the Malum Ultimate comes in a variety of colors and styles. The single tone Malum Ultimate makes the same tone every time. The gold plays eight different tones randomly and the selectable allows you to pick any of the eight sounds or have the tones play randomly. All Malum Ultimates allow you to choose between sound only, vibration only, and sound and vibration. We have found that children respond differently to certain tones and may even start to tune out some sounds. To avoid this, we recommend the Malum Ultimate Selectable Alarm that offers multiple tones. You can experiment and find which tone works best for your child. Included with every alarm are instructions for use, progress charts, two AAA batteries. So you guys get it. That's what Dr. Google is going to recommend. They're going to recommend a device that you put on your child's underwear that wakes them up. So maybe if we're not treating the root cause that this could possibly be a breathing issue, well, now we're arousing our kids um, to be able to wake up before they, they, they pee the bed. I mean, to be honest with you, I might, I might rather my kid pee the bed and stay in, 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 uh, in sleep than, than I would um, for an alarm to keep going off. Um, at nighttime. So again, we got to treat the root cause. We got to treat the root cause of this stuff. And so enuresis and OSA goes hand in hand. We see so many of our adult patients who say they go to the bathroom two, three, four, five times a night. Like that's not normal, right? So here's a study um, back in 2003, the Journal of Pediatrics, right? And they say that there is a high prevalence of enuresis in children with suspected sleep disorder breathing. And that's because if our breathing is interrupted, if we're not getting deep sleep, we are going to have an increase in the hormone called ANP and a decrease in the antidiuretic hormone. The antidiuretic hormone is the one that's supposed to be secreted at nighttime. That's supposed to prevent our bladders from filling up. So when we have sleep disorder breathing, our hormones are unregulated. They are secreted at unnormal levels and our kids start peeing the bed. We had a kid that was 10 years old that was peeing the bed um, and that Lauren treated. And now mom's like, oh my gosh, the first like literally the first week that she started treating the child and getting them breathing again, the bedwetting just automatically disappeared. These are the amazing things that we can do when we understand the root causes of what's going on, when we understand how to impact breathing. Okay. So some, what are some of the other, other things that we look for? So obviously we look for um, obstruction. We look for tissues that are really inflamed, that are unhealthy, that are blocking the breathing. If the tonsils are this big guys, who, where, how big were they six months ago? We probably, we, pro, we let our, 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 our patient get their tonsils this big before we said anything. My goodness, there's zero, one, two, three, four. If you have a grade three tonsil complex back there, let's get, let's, let's, let's address it. Let's figure out why that, why they're, those lymphatic tissues are growing so big. Let's figure out why there's so much inflammation in the back of the throat. Okay. Then if we have um, a lot of us a lot of the orthodontists out there, they have these CEPHs and a lot of us now have CBCTs. So we can now look for enlarged adenoids, right? Look at those adenoids. That's a, that's a patch of lymphatic tissue that's literally blocking the breathing of the nose, okay? So in my practice, we have CBCT. We have the V17. We have the one that that's, um, does the whole entire head and neck. Look at these lymphatic tissues. Holy moly. How can a kid breathe with these big, huge lymphatic tissues in the back of their nose, not preventing them from getting the proper airflow? This is crazy, guys. If we have a CBCT, let's start looking for this. If we, if we have one that, look, that uh, covers that area, okay? Let's do airway analysis. We know that if we see someone like this, right? I see so many of my adults that have 38 millimeter um, airways, that have 100 millimeter airways. This is, this is bad. This is really, really bad. 
Okay, we wanna have good airways. We wanna grow the airway. If the jaws are developing properly, we're gonna be able to develop the airway. If there's a little space, if you are given a coffee straw and told to breathe through that your whole entire life, of course, what do you think is gonna happen as well? You're gonna have problems. Okay, so let's start doing airway analysis with our CBCTs. Bruxism, holy moly, we see this all the time in our practices. And, and so bruxism is a common uh, sign that we see um, in a lot of our children. And we now know that bruxism is related to improper development of the airway. We now know that bruxism is related to nasal obstruction. If the kid can't breathe through the nose, whether they're allergic to a food that they're eating, whether they have allergies to the air, whether they have sensitivities, whether they're just not developing correctly and they just don't have a good airway. Kids are gonna brux their teeth in order to open up their airway. Kids are gonna ruin their enamel in order to, um, in order to compensate for, for a decreased um, uh, ability to breathe. And honestly, if I had to choose between my kid grinding their teeth and breathing, I'm gonna pick grind. I'm gonna I'm gonna take breathing every time. I'm gonna I'm gonna live with the grinding if I didn't want to address why they're grinding. But if we see this, it's time for an evaluation. There's no other reason why kids are gonna brux. They're not stressed. They can't breathe. They're stressed because they can't breathe. Okay. So we now know this. If you guys watched my lecture last, last Thursday, bruxism is found to be 79% predictive of a sleep-related breathing disorder. Your kids are bruxing, get them help. We have a lot of literature so, to support this. What, the one over here on the left, we know that when our kids have nasal obstruction, over 65% of them will have, um, will have bruxism that is indicative of wear on the teeth. So we can't, we can't always identify all the, 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 one, the cases of bruxism, but what we can do is we can look at the teeth. And if there's evidence of bruxism in a child, we're immediately thinking airway, we're immediately thinking nasal obstruction. The one over here on the left, this study suggests that that tonsil and adenoidectomy could improve bruxism significantly. So what they did was they found these kids who are bruxing their teeth, they took their tonsils and adenoids out, and whoop, all of a sudden the bruxism went away. Isn't that, isn't that funny? Right? Here's a big one in our practices that we look for all the time. And up here on the upper left, you can see a grade one, you know, Kotlo um, uh, measurement, uh, tongue tie. That is an easy one. Sometimes the pediatricians even find this. Sometimes the nurses in the hospital even find this and they find this right away. The grade two over here on the right, the grade three on the bottom left, the grade four on the bottom right. These are the ones that, uh, you know, it's up to us as dental professionals to be able to find these. We need to make sure that the tongues are working properly because we now know so much more research about tongue ties, right? So the first thing we need to do is learn how to evaluate what a tongue tie is. Like I said, so in, a, in an infant, we use a different grading system, but when our kids grow up and for adults and, and when we can actually have them open their mouth and, and tolerate um, uh, some of the things that we say and have them do what we're asking them to do, we now have a different grading system. And this is, comes out of Stanford over in California but by a bunch of uh, researchers, um, Camacho and Dr. Zaghi and these guys. So we now know how, have a way to grade tongue ties. And so you can see grade one being the fact that you can open your mouth to its fullest extent and get your tongue up to the roof of your mouth. Grade two is about 50 to 80% of tongue mobility. Grade three is the one where we have 50 to 25% to of tongue mobility. And grade four, those are those really easy ones to identify. Those are the ones that basically are tied to the tip and tied to the ridge, and there's no mobility whatsoever. So we now have a grading system. I, I urge you to use this. And if you guys want me to send this form over to you as well to be able to hang up in your operatories to be able to look for these things, I would love to do that as well. So um, email me. Okay, so we have a lot of research, a lot, a lot of research on this topic. And so we now know that ankyloglossia, which is tongue tie, is a risk factor for maxillary hypoplasia, right, under development and soft palate elongation. Well, what are, what's the phenotype that we see most often in my clinic, whether it be pediatric or adult? What is the phenotype that I see most often for a sleep-related breathing disorder? Well, I can tell you, it's an elongated palate and it's maxillary hypoplasia. It's a, it's, um, a high arch palate. It's, it's lack of mid facial development. It's lack of jaw development. It's lack of airway development. So we now have so much research to show that if our tongues are tied down to the floor of the mouth, they can't possibly help grow the jaws. They can't possibly help grow the airway. And so here's some more papers, right? And here's my guy CG over here on the left. And what he says was a short lingual frenulum left untreated is associated with obstructive sleep apnea 
Peyronie syndrome at a later age, and a systematic screening at, of the syndrome should be conducted when this anatomic abnormality is recognized. Okay, short, and then over here on the right, we have CG again out of California. He says short lingual frenulum may lead to abnormal oral facial growth early in, a, in life, a risk factor for sleep-related breathing disorders. Careful so surveillance for abnormal breathing should occur in the presence of a tongue tie. I'm starting to put the whole circle together, guys. Hopefully you are seeing the, the dots being connected right before your eyes. So the tongue, and this is the way we describe it. Um, first, big shout out to Dr. Raphael, orthodontist in, um, right outside of New York City in Clifton, New Jersey, one of, my, uh, one of my friends and mentors as well. So thank you for the slide, uh, Barry. Um, so tongue is the scaffold for the maxillary arch. And this is the way we, de we, des we de describe it to our mothers when they come in um, two days, two days, uh, um, two days uh, post-birth, when they come right from the hospital to get the tongue, the tongue release. We describe this in our kids that we see it in. We describe it in our adults because a lot of adults realize that they've, they've had a tongue tie. They realize they have, they've had improper oral facial development and they ask why. And I say, well, you know, the tongue which is supposed to be the scaffold for being able to grow the upper jaw. Yours, unfortunately, was not. You didn't have a scaffold. So the tongue is the scaffold for development. If the tongue sits up on the roof of the mouth 99% of the day, like it should, we're going to be able to develop the jaws around the tongue. People think this whole macroglossia thing is a real thing. Macroglossia can be a, a side effect of uh, medications or um, very, very few people have macroglossia. A lot of people have microplasia, um, hypoplasia of the maxillary arch, okay? So if we don't have a scaffold, if we have, that tongue is stuck to the floor of the mouth, what do you think is going to happen? Well, of course, we're going to get that gothic arch. We're going to get that high arch palate. We're going to get maxillary deficiency, right? We're going to get crowding of the teeth. If the tongue can't drive development, there's, and, and for all of you who, who look at this stuff on a daily basis, next time you're, you're, you're looking at a, a well-developed jaw, next time you're, you're looking at a, um, a well-developed arch, just have the, the, the patient take their tongue and do a suction to the roof of their mouth, you'll be amazed to see that the jaw is the exact same size as the tongue. You'll be amazed to see that. The, the jaws grow around the tongue, right? We know, we'll get into in just a second, I think it'll make a whole lot more sense. Um, so OSA and maxillary deficiency. So pediatric obstructive sleep apnea and the critical role of oral facial growth. What was the con conclusion of this paper? Here's CG again. Uh, pediatric OSA in non-obese children is a disorder of oral facial growth, right? Let's start growing our kids properly. Let's not let our kids have improper oral facial growth, right? Because what we need to remember is the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. If the roof of the mouth is high and vaulted and narrow, Guess what else is high and vaulted and narrow? Guess what else has a deviation in it? Yes, the nasal complex, right? This is something that I had. I had a deviated septum. My maxilla did not grow properly as a child, okay? So I had this deviation in, our, in, in my symptom. I told you guys this about this last Thursday, but if the maxillary bone and the vomer bone within the ethmoidal bone of the nose is not growing at the exact same rate, you're gonna get a deflection of the vomer bone, which is gonna cause a deviation in the septum. If you were scanning your kids when they were younger, you'll see the septum starting to form as the development of the maxilla starts to, to regress or starts to halt. So we need to know tongue down, high arch palate, lack of nasal space, lack of nasal breathing, inability to get airflow the way it goes. Hopefully it's all starting to connect. So you know, if we're already too late on this, we need to rely on our orthodontists. Our orthodontists are so, so powerful. Fortunately, I am very lucky to live in a region where we have great airway orthodontists right locally. They, they treat my kids. They treat my wife right now. And so orthodontists are the doctors that can have the biggest impact on development of the jaws, the face, and the airway. So if we move, move teeth, we ultimately are affecting the airway, whether that be negative or positive. So does your orthodontist include orthopedic development into their treatment plans to straighten and align the teeth? Mine do. So if we look into the orthodontic literature, we can see that William Prophet, I don't know if you guys have flashbacks of us all sitting in an orthodontic lab when we were in dental school and we were listening to Dr. William Prophet back in the day talk about 
um, the way that grow, jaws grow and all that. I don't know. I, I have I have specific flashbacks. They were like the most boring um, videos in the whole entire world. But we have to look at the literature, the respiratory needs and jaw development. This is not enough. This is not anything new. We've known this for a really long time, guys. Respiratory patterns control the development of the jaws. Respiratory needs. Let's take it right out of the book. Respiratory needs are the primary determinant of posture of the jaws and the tongue. Therefore, it seems entirely reasonable that an altered respiratory pattern, such as mouth breathing, could change the posture of the head, the jaw, and the tongue. This in turn could alter the equilibrium of pressures on the jaws and teeth and affect both jaw growth and tooth position. In order to breathe through the mouth, it is necessary to lower the mandible and tongue and extend the tip uh, and extend the head. Um, if these postural changes were maintained, face height would increase, posterior teeth would super erupt, unless there was an unusual vertical growth of the ramus, the mandible would rotate down and back, opening the bite anteriorly and increasing overjet. Increasing pressure from the stress sheets might cause a narrow maxillary dental arch. Aha. So let's just take a look at the literature, guys. So early intervention is key. The American Association of Orthodontists have come out and they finally said, we want to see our kids at no later than age seven. Hopefully all of you guys are having your, your six-year-olds evaluated by an orthodontist at age six. In my practice, we do age three. So we use our orthodontist. You know, my, both of my kids have seen the orthodontist. Um, my, my daughter is going to be three and my son will be five. And they're already in therapy, okay? So early intervention is key. I don't want my kids to grow up and look like me. I want my kids to be a lot better looking than me and a lot smarter than me, okay? So early intervention, early intervention. If you work with a good airway orthodontist, they will be on board with this, guys. Make these relationships with, with your orthodontist in, in your communities. Um, these kids' lives depend on it. So let's look at a little, let's look at some, a, a kid here. So what are you guys seeing? Um, you can think to yourselves here. I know we're on a webinar. Um, as I said last time, I like to do a lot of lectures kind of live. I'm more of a in live uh, person presenter because I like to be interactive with the audience. But what do you guys see here? Hopefully, and what I'm seeing is when I'm looking at this, at this guy's profile, what I'm seeing is retronathia. But what a lot of people may not see is mid-facial underdevelopment. And that is the biggest thing because I know that chin is recessed because of the lack of growth within the mid-face. Look, look at this guy's zygomatic bone. Look at his cheekbones. He is underdeveloped. You can draw a straight line down um, from basically his, the, the top of his eye socket down to his chin. That is bad. That is a lower and mid-face deficiency. He looks terrible, right? We see sclera of the eyes on the right side here, head on. What do we see? We see more white of the eyes. We see more of the sclera under than we do over. Our kids' eyes should be centered into their craniofacial complexes. You should see as much white above the, the, um, the eye that you do below. This kid is also sitting here with a rest posture of open mouth rest posture. Look at this. This is sad. This is a kid that has air coming in through his mouth. Why? Can he not breathe through his nose? Is he, is he allergic to something? Is he eating foods that are causing him not to be able to breathe? Does he have a tongue tie? What is it? We have to figure this out, guys. Right, so here's, here's, here's something that should help you figure this out. The normal or physiological way of breathing is through your nose. Breathing through the nose permits to purify the air by the structures inside the nasal cavity. In that way, the air entering into your nasal and oropharynx, your throat, is not going to heavily affect the lymphoid tissue in the adenoids and tonsils, which is the last barrier to catch harmful particles in the air before it reaches your lungs. Besides clearing the air from harmful particles, nasal breathing stimulates the production of gases and substances in the nose, which are going to facilitate the entrance of the air in the lungs and prevent infection in your respiratory system. Mouth breathing allows the air to pass directly into your throat, where the adenoids and tonsils are located. In that way, the air entering into your body through your mouth has not previously been purified. 
and the mm -hmm. lymphoid tissue in the adenoids and tonsils become the first defensive barrier against the harmful mm. particles contained in the air. As a consequence, that lymphoid tissue overgrows, occupying a large mm. volume of your throat. That makes more difficult for the nasal breathing and you make a habit of breathing through your mouth. In order to breathe through your mouth, your lower jaw has to come down as well as your tongue has to rest on the floor of your mouth. Breathing through the nose is the correct way and so the tongue is able to rest on your palate, stimulating a normal growth and development of your upper jaw. Conversely, when you breathe through your mouth, your tongue has to descend and protrude. At the same time, the pressure of your cheeks increases pushing the upper jaw inwards. So the growth and development of your upper jaw is negatively affected, resulting in a narrow and high palate. The upper dental arch acquires a V-shape instead of being a rounded dental arch. Therefore, your teeth do not have space to properly align. This also produces an incorrect swallowing function. Every time you swallow, between 1,600 to 2,400 times per day, the tongue positions low, staying away from your palate. That forces the tip of your tongue to position between your upper and lower front mm. teeth. That pushes your front teeth to show out of your mouth and your tongue resting on the floor of your mouth with the tip of the tongue between your front teeth. That is called an open bite. Mm as your upper and lower front teeth do not touch when you close your mouth. All those dysfunctions, mouth breathing, incorrect tongue posture, open mouth, and incorrect swallowing are going to continue affecting the growth and development of your upper and lower jaws. Mm. And as a consequence, there is less room for your teeth and they become crooked. Remember, the nose is for breathing and the mouth is mm. for eating. Breathing through your nose and keeping your mouth closed with your lips together is going to help your upper and lower jaws to grow and develop better. But more importantly, it makes you healthier. So that is a video that we show in our practice um, just about every single day. Um, and so, okay. And so yeah, I know Lauren uses that on pretty much all of her patients with all of the moms and dads of the patients that come in. Um, and it's just such a powerful video. It's Dr. Ramirez. He's, he's fantastic. He's out of uh, uh, um, Canada. And so I've had the privilege of working with him and hearing him speak uh, many, many times. So uh, a wonderful resource, wonder, wonderful, wonder, wonderful resource uh, with pediatric sleep breathing um, problems. But that's a, that's a very powerful video. So you guys can get that on YouTube and, and show that in your practices as well. Um, and it's about education. Educate your moms and dads on how they should be breathing and how their kids should be breathing. So don't estimate, don't underestimate the need to breathe, breathe nasally. Does there, anybody remember hearing about nitric oxide when they were in school? Well, nitric oxide is a key regulatory signaling molecule that is found in, you're right, the nose, the paranasal sinuses. And so we have a, a, a very prevalent um, amount of nitric oxide that's located in the sinuses. And so we have about 2000 parts per billion in the sinuses. We have 180 parts per billion in the, in the actual nasal complex, and we have 10 parts per billion in the air. So we, we get all of our nitric oxide, which is extremely important. I'm going to go over that in just a second from our noses. Okay. So when we breathe through our noses, we're able to dilate our airways. We're able to get better oxygen delivery. Okay, there's many, 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 many effects of nitric oxide. We can uh, ward ourselves off of viruses, right? Like the coronavirus. We can, if we're breathing through our noses, we can use the natural filter that our bodies were given to be able to protect us. Okay, there's a lot of, a lot of benefits to this, right? And we tell our patients, breathing through the nose gives you warm, moist, purified air right? Nice and clean air. Breathing through your mouth gives you cool, dry, dirty air, right? The nitric oxide kills that deadly bacteria. Um, when you breathe through your nose, you are lowering your blood pressure. When you breathe through your mouth, you are increasing your blood pressure. Nasal breathing leads to better performance during exercise, oxygen delivery. Um, it can uh, it can be used in the treatment of asthma, high blood pressure, heart disease, you name it. I mean, we are less likely to be susceptible to common cold and, and, and infections. Um, and we now know, you know so much more that I just went into about how, how unhealthy uh, mouth breathing is on oral facial development and on breathing, right? So there's so many different, these are just a few, there's so many different benefits to breathing through the nose and getting that nitric oxide into your blood system. 
Okay, so, and this is one of my favorite quotes, mouth breathing is a compensation which will eventually lead to pathology if not corrected. Yes, does every mouth breather have heart disease? No. Does every mouth breather have sleep apnea? No. Does every mouth breather gonna, gonna have something that goes wrong with them? No, but it is a compensation that will eventually lead to something wrong, whether that be when the person's 70 years old or whether that be when the person's two years old. We never know. All of, our, all of us are different. All of our bodies compensate different, but why compensate? And that's what we do at our center. We, don't know, we, don't, we tell people not to compensate. We give people the power to be able to breathe the way that they should be breathing. Okay, this is nothing new, guys. Here's an excerpt from 1908. This is Dr. DeLong, right in my backyard here, uh, right, uh, right west, west of us from Philadelphia in Redding, Pennsylvania, right? And what he says is he's talking about mouth breathing, habitual mouth breathing, and the consequence of malocclusion, the consequence of crowding of the teeth. So what does he say? You recognize signs of mouth breathing. You recognize that the chin recedes and the teachers will accuse the children of being inattentive at school, right? So mouth breathing, lack of growth, um, attention problems, behavior problems, sleep apnea, these things are all related. They were looking at this stuff back in 1908, okay? So what are the top 10 signs for all you parents out there? What are the top 10 signs for all you providers out there that wanna start looking for this, that observe your patients when they walk into your office? Well, snoring, bedwetting, allergies and sinus problems, frequent colds, swollen tonsils and adenoids, the allergic shiners, which a lot of our kids present with right underneath their eyes. They have these kind of like dark circles. That is lack of oxygenation within the paranasal cavity. That is lack of oxygenation um, of the skin underneath the eye. So if all the oxygen is going in and out of the mouth, we're completely bypassing our filter and the part where we get all of our healthy air, okay? Chap lips, forward head posture, teeth grinding, lack of concentration, you name it, mouth breathing affects everything. Mouth breathing affects the oral facial development. It affects the way our kids develop. It affects, it affects how attractive they are. It affects their faces. Okay. We talk about, we talk, we ask, we ask our moms all the time. Are you interested in the development of your, of your child's face for cosmetic reasons? If so, teach them to breathe through their nose. So here's a journal out of a a J uh, AJODO, um, Journal of Orthodontics and um, Dentofacial Orthopedics. And so what, it, what, what this called out was na nasal breathing promotes proper facial growth and development. And so sometimes the orthodontist can be a little bit kind of late to convince of this stuff. And that's okay. There, there, there's more and more of this research that's proving to these orthodontists um, that it's out there. But what we know is that uh, you know, recognition, recognition of mouth breathing in young people by orthodontists is really poor right now. We just need to do a way better, way, way better job. And that includes me, that includes you, that includes everybody that's out there. We need to do a better job recognizing mouth breathing. And then even more, more so, you know, putting a plan in place to be able to figure out that mouth breathing. It's hard for me to like, you know, go to my social events and see, you know, my best friends and they have their kids and the mouths are just dropped to the floor and they're breathing through the mouth. Like I almost, I want to say something, um, but I need to, I need to start, need to start, you know, educating even my friends on this stuff. So let's talk about what the effects of mouth breathing can look like for some case studies, right? So this is a popular one. So you can see in the top right-hand corner, um, this is a girl who breathes with her mouth on the left. She has her uh, mouth closed. These are, these are twins. And you can see the developmental issues that can be caused from, from a person who doesn't breathe through their mouth. So on the, on the bottom lower left picture, we can see this person has competent uh, oral rest posture. The lips come together. The chin looks good. On the right side, you can see the other twin has a problem. When she puts her lips together, you can see that mentalis bunching up really pretty, uh, pretty aggressively. Can you see all that bunching of the mentalis? So she is actively having to contract her muscles to be able to get her, her lips together because of, of her lack of development, because of what happened right here. She's been breathing through her mouth. We see a lot of kids that look like this. We see a lot of kids that basically walk around with their mouths open. And then it, it takes them you know, a lot of effort and strength and compensation and adaptation and uh, stress on the jaw joints in order to get these lips together in order to breathe through the nose. That's a problem, okay? This is one of the co coolest cases in the world. So if you look at this young boy, he was about, uh, I think he was like eight years old or 10 years old here. Beautiful development, nice looking boy. Um, for his 12th birthday, his parents decided to get him a gerbil. 
They did not realize he was allergic to the gerbil dander. The, the boy started developing all these symptoms. He started breathing through his mouth. He started having restless sleep. Soon enough, he goes from great oral facial development to by the time he's 16, this is four years of, of uh, having a gerbil in his, in his bedroom. Look at this development. This is terrible. This is awful. All because he couldn't breathe through his nose right? But his parents didn't know any better. They didn't know he was allergic to his gerbil. You got to start putting all these pieces of the puzzle together. I mean, this is how good oral facial development can lead to terrible uh, oral facial development, okay? So here's another great study by Dr. Peter uh, Harvold out of, um, out of uh, um, 1912, 1992. He was, he, was, uh, he was alive. And so he did a, a, a experiment back in 1981 where he did, um, he blocked the noses of monkeys and see of young monkeys. And what he wanted to see was if it affected their skeletal development. And what he found was the monkeys that he put um, blocks in their noses to prevent them from breathing properly, they developed long face syndrome. They developed these high palates. They developed these very, very archy, narrow faces. And so we now know if we plug someone's nose and prevent them from breathing through the nose, we're going to affect their development. So what are some of the other roles that mouth breathing may play in development and health? Well, as do most maladaptations, right? It's all about how are our kids ad adapting? How are, our, how are our kids accommodating? The effects of mouth breathing don't just stop with the development of the jaws. The effects can trickle down the rest of the body, affecting the posture. We see a lot of kids these days that have just terrible posture because they can't breathe. We see a lot of these kids these days who are stuck to their iPads with their heads down, and that causes this um, skeletal and spinal cord sort of um, stress and uh, developmental issues, right? There's a lot of things that this, that this can relate to, okay? Here's CG's um, musculoskeletal hy hypothesis. And basically what he's shown here is it's all related. It all starts with mouth breathing and with mouth breathing, you get local inflammation. As you saw in the Dr. Ramirez video, when you breathe through your mouth, you have no filter. There is no filter to prevent inflammation from getting into your system. If we have inflammation, we're going to start growing our tonsils and our adenoids. We're going to have poor nasal breathing with increased upper airway resistance. We can have these compensations that we make. We can start tilting our heads forward. We can have you know, systemic inflammation. And then, of course, we can have abnormal oral facial growth improper development of our jaws, of our structures, of our mid faces, right? And then that leads to even more mouth breathing. So, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? I mean, a lot of, a lot of the research is pointing to the fact that, you know, mouth breathing has occurred for whatever reason. And that's not, that, that's probably not the root cause. We're going to talk about that in just a second, but that is pro that is the initiation that leads to all these other things that continue to spiral downwards. My good buddy and um, friend and colleague, Dr. Saru Sagi out of Los Angeles, California. He's a physician. He's an ear, nose, and throat doctor. He is a sleep surgeon. He's fantastic. I think if anybody has as good of a program as Dr. Joanna Green with the infants, it's Dr. Zaghi out in California. He's amazing. Um, but he does a lot of research for, uh, with, with Stanford and with um, CG out there before he passed away. And so Dr. Zaghi is amazing. If you haven't heard about Dr. Zaghi, you better get him on your radar because he's a lot smarter than I am and he can teach you guys a lot more than I can. Um, but what he has, he's created his own little um, circle of dysfunction. So he has now recognized Dr. Zaghi a few years ago when I first started kind of working with him more, he was talking a lot about tongue ties. And um, now he has uh, advanced to not just talking about tongue ties, but talking about um, limited tongue space. And so what he's now, he just put this together. He, he rolled this out. We were in Florida um, a couple months ago, myself, my wife, Dr. Um, Joanna, we were all down in um, uh, Florida in Fort Lauderdale with Dr. Zaghi, and he rolled this out uh, to us. And what he said was, if you have limited tongue mobility, you're going to eventually then have a low resting tongue posture. If you have a low resting tongue posture, you're going to have postural maladaptations. You're going to have skeletal changes that I was just talking about. You're going to have limited tongue space. And when you have limited tongue space, you're going to have dysfunctional oral myofascial compensations, right? That's what leads to all these patients that have TMD and sleep breathing disorder. So really Dr. Zaghi has gone from one of tongue mobility to tongue space. And so 
he's such a, uh, he's such a great, great um, kind of resource in our field. And he just puts out so much research. He's amazing. And uh, he's become a friend of mine who I can text and ask him um, a lot of questions whenever things come up. So he's a great resource. So let's talk about, let's talk about this. Why do people actually breathe through their mouths? Well, mouth breathing usually begins as a compensation, guys, a compensation in response to a nasal airway obstruction, whether that be allergies, enlarged tonsils and adenoids, tongue tie, deviated septum, right? Or maybe it's a learned behavior. Maybe they have an oral facial myofunctional disorder. Maybe they have a thumb sucking disorder. Maybe they chew on their hair. Maybe they have a blankie disorder that rests in their mouth. Maybe they are using sippy cups that have the spouts instead of open cups that where they have to actually use their oral musculature the right way, right? We've tried to get our kids off these spouts, these sippy cups um, from the time they were able to hold a cup. Um, so what are some long-term issues with mouth breathing? Well, most concerning, we already talked about a lot of this, right? Most concerning are the long-term issues that are associated with mouth breathing. We have crooked teeth, right? We keep, our, we keep our orthodontist really busy with all this mouth breathing that we got going on. Mouth breathing, crooked teeth, send them to the orthodontist and have them, you know, tip the teeth out if they're not orthopedically developing the arches. And, you know, then, they're, then the kid is made to wear a retainer for the rest of his life because, you know, really these teeth are just tipped, right? And they're not actually into the correct locations because there's not enough uh, development of the maxilla to be able to accommodate these teeth, right? Bruxism, tooth grinding, poor sleep, attention deficit, fatigue, craniofacial pain, you name it. It's the stuff that I see with my adult uh, patients all the time, the progression of chronic disease and illnesses. So we have to look into the research and the research tells us that the breathing mode, just like Dr. Prophet told us about how teeth come into the mouth and how respiration kind of determines max maxillary growth and oral facial development. Breathing mode um, influences our development overall. Mouth breathing, nasal disuse, pediatric sleep breathing disorder, mm -hmm. understanding nasal breathing, the key to evaluating and treating sleep disorder breathing in, in adults and children. The research is out there. We just have to read it. CG, before he died, said, towards restoration of continuous nasal breathing is the ultimate treatment goal in pediatric obs obstructive sleep apnea, right? Isn't that the goal? Don't we just want to have our kids breathe through their noses so they can develop properly? so they can grow out of this sleep apnea issue? What we find is that when, when kids develop these sleep breathing disorders, it just snowballs and it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse. And they never reestablish proper nasal breathing at nighttime and during the day, right? Establishment of nasal breathing should be the ultimate goal to secure adequate craniofacial and airway development in children. This is what Lauren does in my practices every day. She teaches kids how to identify the obstructions that are there. She gets them out and then she teaches them how to breathe through it. So evolution, guys, I, I, I talk about this all the time, the evolution and revolution. Are we evolving? Our prehistoric maxilla, you dig up any skulls back in the day, they're all big. All 32 teeth are in. Look at, look at us today. We take the skeletons of, of, our, of our jaws today and they're narrow, they're high, they're, the teeth are crowded, the teeth are tipped. We got dissonance on the buckle, um, on the buckle, buckle bony uh, structures of our jaws. I mean, what's going on? So the prevalence of crooked teeth, 75% of our children ages six to 11 and almost 90% of our youths 12 to 17 have some type of malocclusion. We wait until there's a malocclusion and then we fix it. Do you guys know of anybody who has, whose, whose kids, their teeth have come in straight, right? A lot of kids are crowded these days. Why? Malocclusion is mo in modern populations is higher than in ancient times. So it begs the, the question, are we evolving? Or are we not? There's a lot of books out there. There's much evidence that jaws and faces do not grow the same size that they used to. Buy this book. It's amazing. I have it right behind me here in my, in my, in my uh, desk here right? Sitting in my bookshelf. This book is behind here. So first scale evidence of malocclusion didn't appear till the industrial revolution, right? Everybody's skulls were growing correctly. We were evolving so well. The industrial revolution hit. Our air got polluted. Our foods got softer. We started developing pouches. We started developing processing of food. I'm not one for for this anthropological stuff, but my good friend Kevin Boyd speaks very, very knowledgeably, 
knowledgeably about this. And him and Dr. Mariana Evans have these amazing studies going on at University of Penn right now where they are looking at skulls and figuring out all this stuff. So I'm not one to talk about this, but if you want to hear more about anthropologic studies of why our jaws are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, start reading, start looking up Kevin Boyd, start looking up Mariana Evans. These are the leading, they're the pioneers in this field. Okay. If you want to understand why this is going on. So why do we want to start early? Well, because we have a window of opportunity, guys. By age six, 80% of our jaw growth is complete. By age 12, 90% of our jaw growth are complete. We're not getting much bigger after the age of 12 with our jaw growth. We're not able to accommodate development of our maxilla after the age of 12 naturally. Then we're using artificial things. The earlier we treat, the more influence we can have on development. So let's talk about this mouth breathing. How do we fix it? Okay, make sure we eliminate all the obstructions. You're not gonna be able to fix mouth breathing if you don't identify a tongue tie. You're not gonna be able to fix mouth breathing if you don't figure out why the tonsils and adenoids are so, are so swollen. You're not gonna be able to fix mouth breathing if you don't get rid of an oral habit. Lauren does such a good job working with our thumb suckers, our people who are, who are stuck on pacifiers, who bite their nails, who chew on their tags of their blankies. You know, you name it, Lauren works with these oral habits. She, she helps rehabilitate these kids right? Allergies, sensitivities. Know if your kids are allergic to animals. Know if your kids are allergic to a gerbil that you just bought them for their birthday that you put in their room. Know if your kids are allergic to the cat that sleeps in the room. Know if your kids are allergic to the dog that has uh, dander all around the house, right? We have, to, we have to start understanding the root causes of this stuff. So we fix mouth breathing by making sure we eliminate the obstructions, and then we teach them to breathe through their noses. Unfortunately, I'm here to tell you guys, even if you find the root cause, you get the cat out of the house, the, the, the kid starts being able to breathe again, sometimes they, they can't do it. Myofunctional therapy is the only way to teach them to breathe through their noses again. It's the only way to teach them to stop having them breathe through their mouths. Now, so one of my friends and colleagues, Dr. Barry or Raphael, thank you for this quote. I love it. And I hope it means a lot to you guys as much as it means to me. We do two things. First, we make the airway easier to breathe through. We make the airway easier to breathe through. Then we teach them to breathe through it. It's a two-part therapy, guys. We make it easier for a kid to breathe, and then we teach them to breathe. Two parts, two parts, two parts. So, Thank you, Dr. Zaghi. I know I steal a lot of slides from my mentors, but they are just so, I mean, they're so good. I have to steal them. Um, so um, credit to Dr. Zaghi here. He talks about the treatment for pediatric sleep uh, disordered breathing. He talks about therapy, myofunctional therapy. He talks about medications. He talks about surgery like tonsils and adenoids. He talks about dental orthopedic development. How cool is that? We have an MD that is now looking out for us dentists. We have an MD who sends a ton of his cases to an orthodontist. Crazy, right? And then we have CPAP, of course. So let's start off by talking about what we can do to ask our, our parents' chair side whether they're interested in helping their kids grow and develop and, and improving their kids' lives. So in our practice, we say to our parents, how interested are you in your child's health? How interested are you in saving time and money on treatment? How interested are you in improving your child's self-esteem? How interested are you in improving your child's sleep and school performance? How interested are you in improving your child's athletic performance? How interested are you in improving your child's appearance? If that doesn't resonate with a parent, you're out of luck, guys. Sorry to say, you're out of luck. So let's talk about CPAP. So CPAP in kids, we know that it is safe and it works. The research is there. Do we want to use a CPAP? <laughs> I'll be damned if I let my kid get on a CPAP because I don't want, because I now know through the research that the pressure of CPAP on the mid phase can restrict facial development. I'm trying to have my kids look beautiful. I'm trying to have uh, correct oral growth for my kids. I want my kids to have double the airway size that I had. So no, I'm not going to put my kid on a CPAP. I'm not going to uh, uh, subject my kid to, to having a machine breathe for them at nighttime. We know it works, but is it the correct, um, is it the correct therapy? Maybe for some, not for my kids. I know that. Am I going to start relying on steroids inside my kids' noses in order to calm down those swollen tonsils and adenoids? Am I going to start using Flonase? Am I going to give my kids drugs like Singulair, Zyrtec, Claritin? Am I going to start giving my kids Allegra? Not me. 
Okay. Here's a study on, on singular. It works singular. You start using singular on kids. It will limit the amount of sleep related breathing disorders. Is that the best thing for the kid? In my opinion, no. Here's some side effects. Singular has neuropsychiatric uh, side effects, including agitation, aggression, anxiousness, dream abnormalities and hallucin hallucinations, depression, insomnia, irritability, suicidal thinking, behavior, um, and tremors. I think that if you put your kid on singular, they might get less N3 sleep. They might get less deep sleep. They might have less um, secretion of the human growth hormone. I don't know, but it works in some kids. Just, I'm not willing to try on my kids. Using clear nasal spray. Now here's something we use on my kids every single day, three times a day. And the studies are great. This is not a steroid. There is no rebound effect. This is to increase motility of, the, of nitric oxide. This is to increase airflow in, into my kids' noses. This is a great, great, great resource we use all the time in my practice. And I hope that you guys will start using this as well. Have your kids who can't breathe through the nose, have you, I use this three times a day because I had nasal obstruction because I didn't develop properly, okay? So I use this three times a day. It's called clear. And what it does is it prevents the aggregation and, and congregation of bacteria within the nose. It will limit the amount of sinus infections. It will limit the amount of ear infections. There's plenty of research on this. And if you guys want me to give you a presentation on, on um, some of these kind of uh, therapeutic things that we use um, in our practice, I will absolutely do that. Nasal saline rinse here. We use the Neil Medi rinse for our adults, the clear sinus rinse for our adults and our kids. Um, so let's move on to the next one. What is the next one? So this one is surgery. So tonsil and adenoid surgery. TNA surgery. This is good. This is good stuff. We sometimes, if we can't get to the root cause and we can't get these lymphatic tissues to to, to um, shrink on their own by transitioning to someone into nasal breathing and being able to identify the root cause of the, the reason they're inflamed in the first place, then let's get these tonsils and adenoids out. We don't have time to waste. I don't have time to waste for my kids to not grow properly, okay? So tonsils and adenoids works. This study here shows, this chat study, this is one of the best ones that's out there. It basically looks at neurocognitive function for kids who have early intervention of, of uh, um, TNA surgery versus ones who, who prescribe to watchful waiting. And what we see is significant results, significant results. You get the tonsils and the adenoids out, kids can breathe easier. Now you might not be treating the root cause and you might need to send your kids to Lauren to get to the root cause, but at least you're giving the, your kids the ability to breathe through their, their noses by taking the tonsils and adenoids out. At least you're buying time. The tonsils and adenoids on a lot of our kids, they grow back if we don't treat the root cause. But hey, I'd rather my kids' tonsils and adenoids grow back two years later and have to be taken out again than I would for them to have two years of, of, of improper development, two years of improper sleep. So TNA surgery is good. We have to have our ENTs on board with this. So back in the day, everybody got their tonsils and adenoids out. We've gone through these like um, different port parts of, uh, of um, we've gone through these different points in our uh, culture where we've basically taken out tonsils and adenoids, not taking them out, taking them out, not taking them out. Well, back in the day when we took out tonsils and adenoids, we had way less diagnosis of ADHD. And there's, is there a connection to that? I, probably. So what we now know is that they did these studies on TNA surgery and how that can affect ADHD. So the, what this study found was that with TNA surgery, this is from 2016, with TNA surgery, mm -hmm. um, it can significantly improve a child's diagnosis of ADHD. Okay. So here's another study. And what this one says is children with positive clinical assessment of OSA, but negative PSG, meaning you've seen the signs and symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea or sleep-related breathing disorders, but they've come back negative with a PSG negative for sleep apnea, that there's a significant improvement when you take out the tonsils and adenoids compared with just observation alone. We know that our ENTs need to be on board with this stuff. We need to get our kids. We need to be advocates for our kids. I just had um, my three-year-old, we did a telemedicine um, uh, conference with uh, one of the doctors over at Nemours <clears throat> last week, my wife and I, for my three-year-old, she's going to have her tonsils and adenoids taken out as soon as we can get back. Um, again, it's, I, don't, I don't practice watchful waiting. I practice, you see something, you say something, you do something. That's what I practice. So why isn't this, this more routine? Well, I've learned quite a bit dealing with the politics of dentistry versus medicine that, that typically it's usually a financial reason. And so 
what we're seeing is that through the research, the removal of lymphatic tissues are beneficial in almost all suspected cases. So why the heck are we not taking them out? What could possibly hold back this treatment? Well, you guys probably guessed it. And it, a lot of times it comes down to dollars and it comes down to cents and it comes down to medical insurance. Look at this. This is the medical necessity from Blue Cross. This is, so we have Aetna and it's the same thing. Tonsillectomy is considered medically necessary if you meet the following criteria. Either one, both of these have to, have to be met. A history of recurrent throat infection. That means, guys, seven episodes, seven strep infections in one year. That's not enough, guys. The second thing that has to be met is be here. Documentation in the medical rec record for each episode, and it must include a temperature um, spike or it must uh, involve some sort of cervical ad uh, adenopathy, tonsillar ex exudate, um, positive test for streptococcus. So one of those. Number two is tonsillar hypertrophy and a positive diagnosis of OSA, a condition related to sleep, sleep uh, um, breathing disorders. It has to be um, it has to be correlated to growth retardation, poor, poor school performance, enuresis, behavioral problems. Like, gosh, how much, I mean, how, how much evidence do we have to show before our kids can get what they need? Or suspicion of tonsillar malignancy, like a pathology there. I mean, Christ, we have to have our kids have cancer in their throats before they'll, they'll start taking this stuff out. I mean, these insurance companies are ridiculous. And not only are they ridiculous, but they treat our ENTs very unfairly. Take a look at this. This is, a, this is an excerpt from a kid um, who had their tonsils and adenoids taken out. Guys, these ENTs are getting the same rate for tonsil and adenoid surgery, a potentially life-saving procedure that we get for a three-surface filling. You guys realize that? Like these... ENTs are taking these kids into surgery. They're getting $300 reimbursement. That's like us doing a filling. It's crazy. And the insurance companies are driving this, right? Even if we do get our kids in, like, like, like with my kids, even if we do take the tonsils and adenoids out, is that enough? I don't think so. We need to then, as soon as the tonsils and adenoids out, that's when we take pay particular, particular attention to the breathing pattern of our kids. Now that we've given them enough room to breathe, are they breathing through their noses or are they breathing through their mouth? And so this um, article here by, again, here's my guy CG, right? The godfather of sleep medicine. He says the assessment of mouth breathing during sleep should be systematically performed post uh, tonsil natinoidectomy and the persistence of mouth breathing should be treated with myofunctional therapy, right? We gotta send our kids over to Lauren to get better. Lauren is key to this, okay? Here's another, here, and so we're talking about dental orthopedic development. So we, if you have an airway orthodontist in your, in your town, great. If you're around me, great. We use these things in my practice, but we use the Alpha Appliance. We use the Myobrace, AGGA, the Vivos DNA Appliance. You got your, your functional appliances that help, that have um, basically appliances that utilize the tongue to be able to drive growth. And then you have your structural appliances. These are ones that are typically used on kids who are a little bit older, where a lot of the development has already occurred. You know, we got the Hang Expanser. We got the Hyrax. We got the, um, the Moon Scale expander right down here the uh, msc we have my wife in this right now she looks fantastic by the way arches are grow or have grown beautifully nose is wide open we have our marpy here maxillary assisted rapid palatal expansion right there's a lot of different uh, orthopedic developmental appliances that we can use and guys get the teeth out of your head this is not about straight teeth this is about growing the the jaws and having our patients be able to breathe the teeth will follow i promise you if you make if you allow the bones to grow the way that they want to the teeth will come in i promise you it's it's going to be okay if the teeth are not touching all the way if they're crowded it's going to be okay we got to do this expansion first okay there's a lot of research on this. Rapid maxillary expansion may be a useful approach in dealing with abnormal breathing during sleep, right? Dentists, orthodontists, we are at the forefront of this stuff. We can help. We can develop the jaws, 
okay? And last but not least, myofunctional therapy. This is Lauren, right? We have a myofunctional therapist in our office. She treats all this stuff. What is myofunctional therapy? A lot of dentists, I'm so surprised, never heard, hear this stuff and they don't um, refer their patients to a myofunctional therapist in their community. You guys need to. It's the treatment of facial muscles to improve the muscle tone and establish correct function and control of the jaws and the tongue and the lips. So these muscles of our mouth and our face help establish development of our jaws, our teeth, and most importantly, our airway, guys. Let's look beyond the teeth, myofunctional therapy. Let's use the muscles to develop the jaws. Let's use the muscles to develop the airway. Our therapist, Lauren, teaches people how to breathe through their nose and not their mouth. So what are the goals? To simplify this, we got to get the lips together. We got to get the tongue up on the palate, like Dr. Ramirez said, and we got to breathe through the nose. These are our goals in myofunctional therapy. Why is it so important? Well, we talk about genes, right? Oh, my dad had it. Uh, his dad had it, blah, blah, blah. Our genes tell our bones how to grow. Yes but our muscles tell our bones where to grow. Explain how this works over here on the right. This turtle, when it was little, got caught in this soda can, and that's the way the turtle developed. This is just like our jaws, guys. Most malocclusions are not a genetic issue. Most of them are a muscle issue. And what we say at our practice is, the, uh, the, the muscles dominate the bones and the airway dominate the muscles, right? Respiration, respiration, airway, airway, airway. The use of functional appliances. We use these in our practice all the time, all, all the time. My, my, my son and my daughter both have functional appliances, okay? And so here's a little video of, of um, a quick little side of what these functional appliances can do for a patient. We now know that when we start to see signs of crooked teeth, it usually means the jaws aren't growing properly. Bad oral habits, like not swallowing the right way and breathing through your mouth, are the main causes of the crooked teeth and jaws. The forces of the tongue, cheeks, and lips combined with these bad oral habits can have a big effect on how your teeth are positioned, as well as how your jaws grow. A normal top jaw grows properly because the tongue rests in the correct position which is in the roof of your mouth, known as the correct tongue resting position. If your tongue does not rest in the roof of your mouth, the top jaw will become too narrow, so teeth won't have enough room to grow straight. Another thing to watch out for is if you're swallowing the wrong way, with lots of movement in the bottom lip. When this happens, your front teeth will be pushed backwards, and this also causes your teeth to be crowded. Your myobrace, as well as the myobrace activities we're going to talk about, will help you fix those bad habits so your teeth and jaws can grow the right way. If you have a look at this boy, you can see what happens when we change from an incorrect tongue position to the correct tongue position. Once those bad habits have been changed, you can notice the difference straight away. So, how does your myobrace work? The myobrace appliances work by teaching your tongue to rest in the correct tongue resting position, breathe through your nose normally, and swallow the right way. <clears throat> the myobrace is a very important part of your treatment. And it all right, so I'm not going to go into all of that. I mean, you guys get the gist of it. We use these functional appliances in conjunction with therapy. I can't say that enough. Um, when we were first dabbling with this stuff, we started buying all these functional appliances and like handing them out to our patients. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't have a myofunctional uh, therapist on board, your patients are going to come back. They're going to end their treatment. They're going to be very upset that they paid money for a functional appliance without the actual therapy. Basically, what we like to say is giving a child a functional appliance is like giving a kid a violin when they're four years old or five years old or six years old. You can give someone a tool, but if you don't teach them how to use it, if you don't put them in proper therapy, it's not going to work. So we're only, these tools are only as good as the people that represent them. So Lauren uses a lot of these tools and I leave it up to her to, to to decide what type of tools that she wants to use in our practice, but she does use these functional appliances, but Sometimes she doesn't use functional appliances. The point is the therapy only works if the therapist is clear, is, is having mom and dad on board, is having the child commit to therapy. I mean, these are things that we start with our two and three year olds, okay? So it's really, really important that you guys don't just think that this is a magic pill. Hopefully you've learned enough from me that I don't give out magic pills. This is about hard work. This is about identifying the root cause and fixing the root cause. It's not gonna be easy, okay? 
So the benefits of our approach is obviously we want, we, we can, when we work with Lauren, we can eliminate bad habits. We can influence our behavior, right? That is able to drive our jaw growth. That is able to provide straight teeth. That is able to provide long-term stability. I can tell you what, this hasn't soiled any of my relationships with, with my orthodontist because when Lauren gets involved, and she gets the tongue in the right spot, she gets the swallowing better, she gets people breathing through their noses, the orthodontists don't have to bang their heads against the wall. They can take the teeth and they can actually straighten them. I've given them a complex to work with. I've developed the arches for the orthodontist and the orthodontists love getting referrals from me because my patients actually have teeth that are ready to be straightened, right? And, and their therapy lasts a year, maybe two years and, and they don't need retainers, right? So working with my orthodontist in my community, we've set up such a great um, sort of protocol and a step to help our, our patients out. Um, and my functional therapy is not new, guys. My functional therapy has been around forever. I'll let Lauren talk about that in just a second. My functional therapy has finally had the research that's proven. My guy, Dr. Camacho, Dr. Zaghi, they're out in California. They have proven myofunctional therapy alone, alone reduces the AHI of fifth by 50% in adults and 62% in children. Guys, we don't always have to give our patients an appliance for the rest of their life. We don't always have to give our patients a, a CPAP. We can, if we have the right therapist, we can develop a plan to be able to correct the breathing, the daytime breathing and the nighttime breathing. This works on everyone, not just kids. It works on adults as well. Most all of my adults see Lauren for their therapy, okay? And so, like I said, muscle trumps bone, airway trumps all. Okay, nasal obstruction and mouth breathing influence facial growth, which may lead to difficulty breathing while asleep. Continuation of OSA makes cranial growth pattern worse year by year. If the obstruction is re removed, our facial growth develops toward the norm. Most important missing diagnosis is the airway, guys. We are about breathing, healthy breathing around the clock, not just at nighttime. Let's breathe correctly during the day. That's what our therapists work on. Gosh, if you guys don't, don't, have this come up in your dreams tonight, this image, I'm going to be mad at you guys. I'm going to say you guys didn't listen. Okay. Let's stop treating fire. Let's start treating smoke. Please, please, please identify these patients in your practice that need your help. I want, I hope all of you guys have written down um, uh, a name. I, I hope all of you guys have taken out a piece of pen and a paper and you've written down names in your lives that you can, you're going to go help. You're going to get them to a provider that can help them. You're going to get them to the Lawrence of the world to help them grow, to grow better, develop better so that they never have a fire. Let's put me out of business. I, I treat fires every single day. I'm tired of treating the fire. Let's treat the smoke. Okay. I can't say it enough. There's great resources out there. Here's my, here's my guy, Jerry Simmons again. Okay. Jerry Simmons out of Texas, the one who I'm giving you guys all his sleep screening form, the cast form. He has a YouTube. You can go, you can just YouTube this, the neurologic consequences of a misfit mouth. He talks about how an undiagnosed tongue tie creates a lifetime of issues. We have the Connor Deegan video. Please, please, please YouTube this. Finding Connor Deegan, watch this. We don't have enough time to do this today, but if you sign up for my course, we'll go into all of this stuff, okay? All this airway stuff. But this is a very, very powerful, this is a very, very powerful video. It should make all of you guys feel um, more empowered to help, okay? So how early do we start? As soon as there are symptoms, right? Tell me, what is that? That's mouth breathing. What is that? There's mouth breathing. My four-year-old can identify what's wrong with this. I was joking the other day. I had him come sit on my lap while I was, while I was preparing these slides. I said, Bryce, what's wrong with these, with these two people? He goes, well, he said the baby was going to poop on the rug first is, is what he said first. But then he said, um, the baby has the mouth open and the little girl who's sleeping has her mouth open. He knows we've trained our kids, you know, here in this, in our household, we start as soon as there are symptoms. Here's my little Bubba Bryce and, and my daughter Reese back when they were younger with their Myobrace appliances. They earn their TV time, their iPad time by following into their, by doing their therapy. My son Bryce sleeps with uh, tape over his mouth in order to get all the air coming into his nose and nothing through his mouth. We make sure that nothing goes into, into his mouth, creating that inflammation. I want him to develop. I want him to, to be a lot better looking than I am. I want him to be better at sports. I want him to be smarter, smarter than I am. And of course, we have Grinchy on board as well. Grinchy um, 
here next to my son's mouth. He, he tapes his mouth shut at nighttime, right? My mother-in-law made a, 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 a wubbinub for my daughter when, when I educated her on all this stuff. And she's using a Mayo Chew over there. She took off the, the pacifier and she put a Mayo Chew on there. So my daughter was known for taking this thing everywhere and chewing on this thing to develop proper um, chewing mechanics and proper development of the jaw. And so wrapping up here. So some of my take home messages and man, it looks like I'm going to come in right under two hours. I'm so, uh, this might be the first time ever. Um, so Dr. Robinson's take home message, the way that we breathe has a significant impact on growth and development and overall health. A child should not have to choose between sleep and breathing guys. A child should not have to choose between sleep and breathing tonight. When you go home, go check on your child a couple times throughout the night, take a video, send it to me, text it to me. I'll tell you if there's a problem. Observe your kids and the way that they breathe. Please read through my pediatric, my parent um, pediatric um, private eye study. Please, please start observing this stuff. Make sure your kids' lips are touching at all times besides speaking. Start putting the pieces of the puzzle together, guys. Now is the time. Please, please, please attend my fourth annual. I'm so lucky to, and to have such great, Dr. Zaghi will be presenting. Dr. Olmos will be presenting. Dr. Lagmani will be there. Dr. Phelps will be there. Dr. Mariana Evans will be there. Dr. Boyd will be there. Dr. Clower will be there. I'll be there. All the great minds in Airway will be together in Philadelphia. This was supposed to happen on November the 6th and 7th of this year. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we are postponing that to April. Please be on the lookout for a new date. I know a bunch of save the dates already went out and hopefully we are collecting more and more of your guys' information to send to your, um, to your offices, but please come, please learn about this stuff. I am one part of this. These guys that, that I'm standing on their, sh on their shoulders with my message here, they are way smarter than me. They are way better than me. Let's hear from the experts on this. Okay. So go on to integrativeairways.com and learn when the new one will be coming up. We're still trying to negotiate the, um, the contract there for the re, for the um, for the new date. So please keep up to date with the fourth annual pediatric airway symposium. I promise you will leave feeling more feeling a, a sense of knowledge that you've never thought you could you could um, you could have. Okay, subscribe to um, our our social media. We guys we do a lot of fun stuff. Our Instagram, our Facebook, our YouTube. We get we, we present a lot of stuff, man. We do a lot of things, and we we want to share what we do. Contact me, email me anytime you guys want breathe. All right. Help your patients achieve more than they thought was possible and sign up for courses. Go get education. Okay. I'm putting, I'm doing my part to put on this 10 series, this 10 part lecture series. And I'm, I'm hope, hopefully helping all you guys become, you know, better, uh, more whole health centered uh, dentists and providers and physicians and hygienists, but go sign up for courses, guys. The information's out there. Okay. It's up to you to get, to go get it. All right. So that is the conclusion. And I cannot believe I am on time for once in my entire life. So with that being said, I am going to, I am going to leave this slide up. I'm going to hopefully open up the Q and a box and we're going to hopefully get some questions for Lauren answered. Um, can we get access to older lectures? Um, especially the one about the young fit females. Check the chat. Check the chat. Okay. Thanks bud. My son just, just let me know that I should be checking the chat. <clears throat> um, so can we get access to older lectures? Uh, John, unfortunately, I was a knucklehead and I did not hit record for the TMD and Bruxism one. I'm so sorry. I hit record um, for the Karen Smith one, the nutrition one. So yes, that is available. Go on to our website and, uh, or email me and I'll send you a link. Will these lectures be recorded and be able to be viewed? Yes, I did hit the record button, I hope, today. I think this is um, being recorded as we speak. Um, is there any evidence to suggest that habits, thumb sucking pacifiers can change the palate and lead to OSA? Oh yeah, there's a ton of that, uh, Andrea. Thoughts on the effects of tongue ties? Um, yeah. So um, Lauren, are you on here? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, Andrea has a great, a great question about like oral habits, it seems, and how that creates a low tongue position and how that can relate to uh, development and breathing. Um, do you want, you want to take that on for me? Yeah, I mean, of course, like any habits, like thumb sucking, um, prolonged pacifier use, any tongue ties is going to create that low resting tongue posture. And it's crucial as we're growing and developing, we want the tongue up um, to the roof of the mouth because it's going to create nice wide arches. It's kind of our body's natural palatal expander. 
And then ultimately it's going to create a nice wide airway. So if the tongue is resting low, it's not going to support the airway, hold it up. Um, so we do, I definitely tongue tie, any kind of prolonged pacifier, finger sucking is all going to impact that for sure. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so Jonathan says, how do you set a fee for treatment? Do you bill medical or dental? Um, our fees are our fees. We are fee for service. Um, we think that cost is only an obstacle in the, in the absence of value. And that's basically what we say. We realize we have a lot of information that a lot of other people don't. We work very hard. We travel around the country. Lauren knows I take her out to California all the time, Chicago, Florida, Texas, you name it. We do a lot of extra additional things in order to have this education. And so, um, how do we set our, our fees for treatment? Um, well, just that we set what, what we think, uh, you know, our value is. And so do we bill medical or dental? We sure do. We do courtesy medical billing and dental billing in my office. Um, even though we are fee for service, uh, our patients get a lot of great reimbursements through both medical insurance and dental insurance. So great question, John. Um, Anonymous says, what if a child has outgrown the bedwetting phase and still has concentration and ADHD pattern? What would you recommend? Well, that's an easy one. I'd recommend an airway evaluation. I'd recommend you, you take the, um, the private eye home study that Lauren and I give out to all of our patients. And I recommend you start observing your kid. I recommend you bring them in to see Lauren. I recommend you have a CBCT. Go ahead, Lauren. I would add on to that too. I always recommend, you know, parents kind of going in there and recording your child for two minutes at three different points of the night. So right when they go to sleep, middle of the night, and then right before they wake up. Um, because a lot of times, like, you don't know what your child's doing, especially at all different points of the night. So I highly recommend that as well. <clears throat> yep, absolutely. So would, um, would bad breath be an indication of mouth breathing? Hopefully I answered that. Absolutely would be an indication of mouth sure. breathing. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, what is the primary reason for mouth breathing? Hopefully I just identified that with those last few slides. Is Dr. Ryan a GP or an ortho? I started as a GP, uh, John. Um, fortunately, uh, just recently, actually, um, the ADA came together, and I believe the governing bodies are now cre uh, um, recognizing oral facial um, uh, uh, sleep medicine and oral facial pain as a subspecialty within dentistry. Um, so I would consider myself a specialty of oral facial um, sleep medicine. Um, I am not an orthodontist. I've taken a ton of courses on ortho. I do do ortho, um, but I am not an orthodontist. Um, I'm a GP. So tonsils and adenoids go hand in hand, meaning if tonsils are visibly enlarged, so are adenoids. Um, I know, Lauren, you might have some more information about this. Not necessarily. It doesn't always, it, usually yeah. they are kind of hand in hand. Lauren, go ahead and answer that. Yeah, I would say it, do, it doesn't, I mean, it can go hand in hand, but not always. I mean, obviously, clinically, we can see tonsils. Um, as far as adenoids go, you can only see that with like a CBCT scan. So there are many times that I might see really large tonsils, and then I take the scan, and the adenoids aren't as large, or it could be vice versa. So and actually, um, I feel like Dr. Robinson, your son is a perfect answer for that because his tonsils aren't large, but his adenoids are very large. So, yep. yeah. Yep, yep, exactly right. So, um, how do we find a myofunctional therapist? Well, you can go on to just type in myofunctional therapy on Google and you'll be able to kind of look at all the um, governing bodies. There's a, there's a bunch of them. Inter International Association of Oral Facial Myology, where Lauren and I got our initial education, is a great resource. They'll show you how to get the Lauren. Um, the American Academy of Oral Facial Myology, right, Lauren? A A O M. That's another good one. Um, but yeah, I would just go on the Dr. Google and I would ask Dr. Google who's the myofunctional therapist in your area. There's a lot of good ones. I think Lauren's really the only one in our area um, who does it. Um, uh, but you know, she's Lauren. Lauren can still see a lot of kids. So if you're in our area, definitely refer to Lauren. She's great. Um, what kind of tape do you use? So I, Lauren and I differ with this. Um, she uses, she uses the 3M micropore tape for all of her patients. Uh, myself, like my wife, myself, and my son, we all use the Snorless strip um, tape uh, that you can get on um, on uh, Amazon. So you can get a, a huge pack of it. I mean, it'll last for months for like $12. Um, and so what I do is I just take the tape, I put it on the back of my hand, I get it like a little bit less sticky. And then I put it over my mouth every night I go to sleep. Same thing with my son, same thing with my wife. So I like the Butico breathing snoreless uh, strip tape and Lauren likes the 3M micropore tape. Is that right, Lauren? 
it's yeah, 3M um, paper tape by Nextcare is what I like. Um, and then I also recommend really putting either if you don't like Vaseline, um, doing something on your lips to moisten them before you put the tape on as well. <clears throat> yep. Um, so what's the best way to treat an adult using myofascial, myofascial appliance or a sleep apnea device? Everyone is different. Every single person is different. Not a day goes by that I don't see a new patient where I come up with a custom treatment plan. Yeah, some people are not willing to put in the work for myofunctional therapy. Some people are going to be best treated with a sleep apnea device. Most people in my practice are treated with co-therapy. Most all of my patients that I treat with, whether it be dental, facial, orthopedic development, where I, whether I put an expander in, whether I give them a dental appliance, I'm usually I'm usually sending every single one of my patients to Lauren Reinhold for the for my functional therapy. Now, if the patient disagrees and doesn't want to work at it, that's okay. But at least I've given them that option. My functional therapy can literally be used in every single patient. Lauren, I know you would agree. Every single patient that we see needs my functional therapy. Is it enough? Probably not in itself with some of our patients, but it's definitely part of our therapy. Yeah, I mean, and to add on that too, I mean, sleep apnea doesn't happen overnight. It's something you grow into. So um, a lot of these patients that you're seeing also have um, like soft tissue dysfunctions as well. So they definitely need that. And of course, retraining of nasal breathing too. <clears throat> yeah. So to prevent mouth breathing, you said you tape the mouths of your children. Do you worry about aspiration in the event if one of your child vomits? No. So the tape that we use is, um, comes off very easily. I mean, it, it, the, the body... Um, the body is very protective of the airway. And so just like somebody has a gag reflex, um, same thing with the airway at nighttime when you tape somebody's mouth shut. So when you allow the air to come in through the nose, you actually make the airway bigger. Um, you actually dilate the airway. Um, that's number one. So your, the airway is actually bigger when you close your mouth than it is when you have your mouth open. And if the child needs to open their mouth, all they do is just open their lips, the, the tape will rip off. So I, we do not recommend <laughs> um, duct tape. We recommend 3M micropore, micropore paper tape or the Snorless Butico strip tapes. It's very easy to come off. Now, if the child um, wants to take it off, very, very easy. But if they keep it on and they're passive and they're not using all their jaw muscles and all that and grinding their teeth at nighttime, it'll stay on. Now, if you have a, um, um, a, a kid that you put mouth tape on and it's being ripped off before the end of the night, now you know something's going on. You need to come in and have an evaluation. Integrativeairways.com is the website for the upcoming lecture. That is correct. So check that out. Um, okay, so mouth breathing. Wow, a lot of questions. This is great. So mouth breathing affecting development makes a lot of sense, but I have a question about tongue ties and lip ties. Sometimes tongue ties seem overdiagnosed when it comes to breastfeeding issues in my experience. Can you com comment on that and what therapies, surgeries have actually been shown to be effective for, for tongue ties? Um, yeah, Kelly, great question. So, um, are tongue ties overdiagnosed in my particular, um, with my particular population of patients? I think they're very underdiagnosed. Um, I think what you're getting to is they are not treated properly. And I think we don't release people's tongues unless they go through my functional therapy. So, if you see a tongue tie and you want to take your big, fancy, expensive laser and charge a patient a thousand dollars to release that tongue tie you better cross your darn fingers that that blind squirrel finds a nut because not just releasing the tongue is the correct therapy here. If that child is not working with a myofunctional therapist to be able to regain um, proper development, proper use, proper, proper function of the tongue, please don't release the tongue. Please send it to a, to a provider who knows what they're doing. Um, same thing with babies. We don't, we don't release babies' tongues unless they're working with a lactation consultant. We've, we never get a, a referral from the hospital that has not seen lactation before they see us. They come in, I release the tongue, Dr. Joanna releases the tongue, they go right to lactation to be able to work. So we release tongue based off of the Hazel Baker as, uh, assessment. We release tongues based off of the inability to feed, but we don't just release tongues to feed. We release tongues so that the, the, the kid doesn't have to compensate. A lot of babies fly under the radar because the mom decides to use a bottle instead of breastfeed. Um, um, a lot of um, tongue ties fly underneath the radar. And like I said, you don't want to wait until the child is three years old and then have the, the tongue tie diagnosed. If you can catch it when they're a baby, that's the best time to do it because that's the best time to be able to fix it and prevent a lifetime of compensation. So I would, um, I would disagree if anybody thinks tongue ties are overdiagnosed. In my area, they're very underdiagnosed. In fact, 
most of my buddies are dentists most and they don't even know what a tongue tie is i mean a lot of the guys that are that are logging on here they know what a, t a type one tongue tie is they don't even know how to do a, a tongue range of motion ratio and so i think tongue ties are are very very underdiagnosed um from what i've seen and from what the literature tells us <clears throat> lauren would you agree about the tongue ties i do agree yes yep Yes, thank you for the great webinar. How about pediatric patients with really short baby teeth, flat palates, and large tongues? Is this trend a result of mouth breathing too? They tend to grind too. I mean, it could be. I mean, um, that's a great question. I mean, we see we God, we see patients of all phenotypes, right, Lauren? I mean, um, yeah. flat a flat palate, short baby teeth, large tongue. I mean, uh, evaluation, right? I mean, let's get let's get them in for an evaluation and have them fill out the full entire pediatric questionnaire. Let's do a CBC to figure out how big the airway is. Let's see if there's a nasal obstruction. I mean, yeah, I think those 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 kids need to be considered for sure. So I how agree. can we yeah how can we further educate ourselves to learn about these conditions for patients? It's not really something easily accessible like the things you learned in school. In my opinion, I agree. Uh, you have to find these courses that are out there. The American Academy of Craniofacial um, Pain does a good job with it. Myo Brace, the little video that I showed, they do a great job with it. Um, uh, who you, you name it, Dr. Stephen Olmos, one of my mentors, he does a lot of pediatric stuff. If you if you want to look up some names that are really great, Barry Raphael, um, Sarush Zaghi, um, Kevin Boyd, Darius Lagmani, Daniel Clower, Stephen Olmos. These are guys that teach a lot of these courses um, around the country, myself included. Um, we try and teach a lot of this stuff. So yeah, you, you gotta you gotta look hard, man. But but it's out there. You gotta find these courses. Okay, will the CEB email to us? Yes, there is no verification code. We will email it to you. How do you feel about programs like Healthy Start that provide kids with appliances that guide tooth eruption for optimal development? Yes, hopefully I, I went over that. Healthy Start is exactly like MyaBrace. We use those tools in conjunction with a Maya functional therapist to be able to um, help our kids with tooth eruption and, and optimal airway and jaw development. Right, Lauren? Yes, yep. I have observed four out of five of my children breathe through their mouths at night, but I've not noticed any adverse breathing or stopping of breathing at any point. Do you recommend taping their mouths to train them? I would say I recommend taping their mouths to train them, absolutely. I'd bring them into Lauren first or a myofunctional therapist or an airway, um, or an airway dentist, I'd have an evaluation done. You know, like I say, the more information we can collect on these kids, the better. You really, the kids are so multifaceted, they're, they're so complex. So the better, all, if you can send it to a qualified um, pediatric airway dentist or orthodontist or Lauren or someone like that, like that is the absolute best thing you can do is get an evaluation before you start taping their mouth shut. Now, if you think that they're okay with taping their mouth shut, you could always try it. And um, you know, a lot of times that's what Lauren recommends with a lot of her patients. So um, yes, I would recommend that, but um, please don't discount the fact that you probably need to see a provider as well. Who's, who yeah, I would knowledge. say you definitely want to get to the root cause as to why that's happening. So for sure. Any dangers with the tape issues? Um, I've never heard of anybody who's ever had any, any, any problem with tape. Um, I know many, many, many of my colleagues use tape around the, around the country. Um, I've never seen an issue. Nobody's ever died of having tape over their mouth. Nobody's ever suffocated. Like I told you guys, the, the muscles trump bone, airway trumps all. If you need to breathe, guess what? That tape's coming off. And so if you, don't, don't use duct tape, but any other, any other tape, especially the ones that Laura and I recommend, it'll, it'll rip right off if, if there's an airway obstruction. <clears throat> if a child has tongue tie and snores, grinds, or has other symptoms, would you recommend a phrenectomy first, or would you refer, refer out to a pediatrician, ortho, ENT first? I'm wondering as pediatric dentists how we can actually help. Yeah, great, great question. I would not recommend a phrenectomy right off the bat. I'd recommend them go see Lauren. I'd recommend them go see an airway um, orthodontist or an airway dentist first, have a whole treatment plan put together. A lot of times that phrenectomy will be postponed until the child is actually ready for it. So Lauren's going to work at the very minimum of four to six weeks with all children before we recommend a phrenectomy. We will never see a phrenectomy and do it. We will see a phrenectomy, send them to Lauren. Lauren will do the therapy, get the tongue ready, because once you release that tongue, game, game on. Once you release that tongue and you give that, that kid the motion that they need and the, and the function that they need, you better be darn sure you have a therapist that's working side by side with them, teaching them how to use it. Don't, don't look, don't find it and do it, find it, get it over to a therapist, 
let them work on it, and then let that therapist refer back to you for the phrenectomy. So we do that with a lot of, a lot of our referrals as well. If the dentist likes to do the phrenectomy, all good. No, we don't have to do the phrenectomy in our, in our office. You can refer to Lauren. Lauren will get them ready with the therapy, refer back to you with the green light. Everything's good to go. Dr. Jones, go ahead and do the phrenectomy and then send the kid right back to me. Hope that helps. At what point do you recommend tape? If they're sleep apnea, won't the tape endanger their airflow? Um, I recommend tape um, after a comprehensive airway evaluation. I recommend tape as early as two years old. Um, and if there is sleep apnea, won't the tape endanger their airflow? Um, in more times than not, the answer is no. In more times than not, sleep apnea is a perfect indication to start mouth taping. Remember, when we tape the mouth shut, we allow the air to come in easier and we, air, we allow the air to, 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 uh, to um, leave the body easier. We allow the air to have nitric oxide. We allow, allow the airway to dilate. We get better oxygen delivery with our heart and our vital organs. So mouth taping alone has been shown to decrease sleep apnea. So um, hopefully, that, um, hopefully that helps that. Dr. Levine, what's going on, man? How do we get CE? We're going to email you, bud. We will email you um, the next couple days. Thank you for logging on. I appreciate it. Um, where can I find the Butico tape? Uh, Amazon. Amazon.com, Snorless, Butico, breathing uh, uh, strips. Type it in. If there's nasal airway obstruction, is it still appropriate to use mouth tape? Yes, 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 yes. What about raising stress hormones? Yes. They got to get rid of those stress hormones. When we breathe through our noses, we can regulate our, symp our sympathetic nervous system to transition to our parasympathetic nervous system. We want our kids to be able to regulate their stress hormones, their norepinephrine, their cortisol, their adrenaline. We want to, we want to, take those out of the equation at nighttime. So mouth taping is a great, great, great way to be able to change them from sympathetic breathing to parasympathetic breathing. Lauren, anything? <clears throat> I think she's frozen. Um, maybe a silly question, but Lauren, do you notice any skin is issues with tape every night, acne, irritation, et cetera? Um, I think Lauren's trying to log back on here. I don't, I don't notice any issues with... Um... Sorry. Hey, Lauren, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, so I know you do a lot of mouth taping. This, um, Lucy wants to know if you notice any acne or irritations. Um, for me personally, I mean, so that is why I use the 3M paper tape by Next Care. I just think it's um, really good for sensitive skin. So I, I personally prefer that if someone has very sensitive skin, I would run that over the boost secret tape. Yep, yep. Um, okay, so uh, gastric reflux, Lauren. I mean, we see a lot of this in our practice. So, what is the gastric reflux coming from? And that, and that's where you, that's where you need to focus your your attention. Why does the patient have gastric reflux? So, cupping of the teeth, especially in primary teeth, is that from grinding or clenching, or is it from a gastric reflux problem? Yes, you're exactly right you got to get to the root cause. You got to figure out what, if there's gastric reflux and why it's happening. A lot of people who can't breathe properly have gastric reflux because of the negative pressures within their thorax. So we see a ton of gastric reflux for um, patients that don't breathe well. Um, okay. Yeah, that looks like, can you spell Butico? Um, let me open up the chat box real quick here. I'm going to spell Butico for you guys. Butico breathing. And Lauren is an, a, is an official educator in Butico breathing. So not only does she do my functional therapy, but she does breathing as well. She teaches, um, she uses that in conjunction with all of her patients. Um, all right. What else, Lauren? Anything else that, that I didn't get to? No, I don't think so. Um... Awesome. Well, I think we uh, are at 315. And... Um, Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did you get Lauren's contact out there for them? Lauren's contact? No, I did not. Somebody asked the last question from Jessica was how do we contact Lauren? Yeah. Okay. Let me get Lauren's contact out here. Lauren at pain and sleep center .com. Uh, No code. No, no code. We will email all of you guys. We have all of your emails. If you registered for the webinar, like you were supposed to, we have all of your emails. Um, 
So for everybody who uh, logged on, I want to just say thank you. This has been great. Um, I'm going to stay on here with Lauren and we're going to try and answer as many questions as we can. But uh, everybody else who doesn't want to stay on and hear the Q&A, um, feel free to, to um, hop off and uh, go about your days. And hopefully we'll see you on some, some new uh, some, uh, upcoming courses. So let me just go through this, Lauren. Are you looking at the chat box? Yeah, I am. I'm checked. Let's see here. Um... Can we get the template of the five questions? Yes, I will send that out, guys. I will send that out in my email. Adenoid phase, yeah. Thank you for the great information. I send all of my patients age six to seven to ortho. Beautiful, Jimmy, that's awesome. Um, what can an orthodontist do for a patient that is less than six? Well, they can identify things and get them over to the right provider. Um, they can also put an expander in. They can do myofunctional therapy. I mean, most of the time, patients under six do just really, really, really good with Lauren and a myofunctional therapist. That is the perfect time. I mean, while the kids are growing so rapidly, while the kids have such like fast um, maxillary growth, if Lauren gets them and teaches them how to breathe and gets the muscles doing what they're supposed to, Lauren can actually drive growth. Um, so I'd say the kids under six years old, um, Lauren is a great resource for that. I mean, anybody really, but Lauren, especially for, for, for under six. So will we, will, will we discuss if you find these issues too late, like 12 years old? Yeah. So if you find, if you find these issues, like if you're, if you're late and if your kids are already, you know, older than six or older than 12 and their, their growth, you know, we've missed that window of opportunity for growth. You know, unfortunately we're going to just have to get the function, right. We're going to have to get the pathophysiology of breathing, right. We're going to have to eliminate all of our obstructions. And then we're probably going to send them to an airway orthodontist to get those, uh, those jaws growing. Um, so don't let your 12 year old get on a CPAP. Don't let your 12 year old, you know, come to my office and have me make a, a, them a sleep apnea appliance. I refuse to make sleep apnea appliances for kids. I don't do it. I know there's a lot of people out there that do it. I don't do it. I, I, I sent them to Lauren. Lauren will develop their jaws. Lauren will get them in conjunction with an airway orthodontist who's going to develop their jaws. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you, it's not too late. You know, we're developing my wife's jaws as we speak. I mean, my wife is very deficient. She's very narrow, very high palate. She's got a lot of sleep, sleep issues. Um, um, you know, nothing that was uh, too evident to us until we found out about all this stuff, but we are growing her jaws through a maxillary moon skeletal expander. And uh, Dr. Evans will be fantastic to come on board here. And in in, I think, is it next week, Lauren, or two weeks? Um, I think it's two weeks. Two weeks? Two weeks. I was in two weeks. I forget. Um, but yeah, Lauren, um, yeah, D Dr. Evans, here it is. So Dr. Evans will be coming on Tuesday. <laughs> April 28th. Yeah. Awesome. Next Tuesday, guys. Um, next Tuesday is Dr. Evans. You guys will learn so much from her. She is a fantastic airway orthodontist. We work with her all the time. Um, so you can find the, uh, that's you, Lauren. Sorry. Can we watch the recording later? Heck yeah. We, I think I recorded it, right, homie? Um, what do you do if the parent does not want their child to undergo TNA? You got to work around it. There's a lot of our patients who don't want tonsils and adenoids. You just got to, you got to kick up therapy. You got to, you got to boost therapy. You got to get the myofunctional therapist working with that kid every week, every two weeks, instead of if they're not going to be willing to take out the tonsils and adenoids, like, you know, Lauren comes to me all the time. She's like, Oh my gosh, this mom is not willing to take out tonsils and adenoids. I'm like, Hey, do your best. And one of my favorite quotes, and I have it actually etched into my wall at the pain and sleep therapy center, Lauren knows what I'm talking about. We have a big, huge, um, etch in on one of our walls. It says, do the best you can with what you know, when you know better, do better. And that's what we do. You're not going to, you're not going to help everybody. You're not going to influence everybody. Not everybody is going to take all five of your recommendations, but if, a, if, a, and, but it, it, for instance, if that patient doesn't want to go through tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, you just have to educate, 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 and just say, hey, we're going to work with a myofunctional therapist. We're going to get the breathing as good as we can, but realize without the TNA removal, we may not get to our peak goals. We may not see the benefits. Um, Jessica McIntyre, where can we find a pain and sleep dental office? Um, email me on the side. I have a lot of colleagues that work um, that I work with around the country. There's a lot of good centers out there. Um, we're kind of the central hub for Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Delaware. So we get a lot of patients from all over the tri-state region, region. So I don't know of any others kind of in our area, but um, if, you, um, if you are looking for one, if you're around the country, um, uh, email me. I'll hook you up with somebody who's good in your area. Um, all of us Airway guys kind of are on the same group chats and all that. And we all talk, talk to each other all the time. <clears throat> 
where can you send an adult patient if you think they need a palatal expander like the one your wife is using? Send them to a guy like me. Send them to a pain and sleep therapy center. I'll do the workup. I'll figure out if maxillary um, palatal expander is good. Send them to an uh, airway orthodontist. Um, there's a lot of great resources out there, you guys. You just have to find these providers. They're all hiding within three hours of you guys. I can guarantee it. Maybe some of you guys more like five hours, but they're out there. We have patients to come and see Lauren from hours away. What about adults? Can we use Myobrace type treatment for them? Eh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can use Myobrace for an adult, Lauren. I mean, we do that just to try and promote better tongue yeah, positioning yeah. and breathing. I'll let you talk about how you, how you, how you treat your adults. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do use um, the appliances in conjunction, but of course, like we do a full workup first. So we want to make sure there's no like obstacles in the way, especially with a lot of the adults and children. So it just depends on really what that patient needs, what the yes, we can use um, that in conjunction with doing myofunctional therapy for an adult. <clears throat> yeah, great. All right, so how, uh, Lauren, here's one for you. And I know this isn't particularly your area of expertise, but how do you help prevent infants from putting their fingers in their mouth? So we work with a uh, SLP locally here um, named uh, Leah. Leah is fantastic. She's a speech language pathologist. She works with a lot of infants and toddlers and um, kids with a lot of these oral habits and things like that. But uh, Lauren, what do you think about kids putting their fingers in their mouth? I mean, I know you have like, you have little thumb sucking things that you do and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I would say like fingers in the mouth is so much harder of a habit to break than I feel like with the pacifier, just kind of removing that. Um, the fingers are obviously attached to you. So, I mean, the program that we have to kind of eliminate that finger sucking really has to be like the child has to be wanting to willing to break that habit. So it is kind of like a hard one to, I feel like really that that's the hardest habit to break for sure. I'm, I don't really have any other feedback on that. Like I said, the pacifier for sure, those kind of things are a little bit easier to take away than actual finger sucking. Yep. Yep. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, uh, sorry guys, I know this is a lot longer than we expected, but there's a lot of great questions coming in. So I appreciate all your guys' feedback. So Betty wants to know if you see a parent wear facets on pediatric teeth and you ask the parents about bruxism, but the parents report that they never hear their kids grind. They didn't realize their teeth were so flat. What is the next step in dialogue? Man, Lauren, how many times have we dealt with this in our, when we used to do dentistry? I mean, we used to deal with this all the time. Betty, here's what I would do. I would show the, I would take pictures and put them up on your big screen next to your chair. I would show the parents the evidence right? This is evidence of the grinding and clenching. And then I would have them fill out the pediatric airway questionnaire. And I would say, and then I would ask, I'd have a conversation. And you know, parents, some parents are willing to talk about this and some are not. If the parent gives you the big X and says, don't talk to me about my, about my kid, you're not my kid's physician, you got to drop it. You got to drop it. But if, you're, but if the parent is open to talking about some of this stuff, you are going to give them the education that they need. So you're going to give them the private eye home study. You're going to say, hey, I want you to do this. You are then going to say, there's obvious evidence of, of, a, of a destructive habit that's going on. I want you to figure out where it's coming from and put, it, put the emphasis on the parent. I want you to figure out where it's coming from. I don't know. I'm the dentist. I don't know. I'm the hygienist. I don't know where it's coming from. I suspect it might be coming at nighttime when they're sleeping. Have you gone into the room and taken video of them three times throughout the night on three separate weeks? The rule of three, three times a night, three separate weeks. You will put together patterns that you never, ever thought was going on. And the parents, it's an eye-opening experience for them. Would you, would you agree, Lauren, three, three times three? Yep, I agree. And for two minutes at a time, too. Two minutes. Yeah. Yeah, Lauren, we should make that three minutes, shouldn't we? <laughs> Yeah, probably. all three, three times a night for three minutes, three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing is typed here. Great lecture. Super informative. Awesome. My nephew. All right. Here's another question, Lauren. So my nephew has it. And for the last two years has been telling his parents who live in the UK, they go to a doctor and they refuse to do anything as he is as he is very young and that's normal as, as they grow. How do we convince doctors in the UK to treat him um, for his bad sleep apnea? Man, 
doctors are doctors, man. You know how it goes. Physicians are tough. They, we, you know, even us dentists, we're tough. We all have our like routines that we were taught in school. And like, can you imagine going into an orthodontic practice and just being a fly on the wall and, and like looking around at the kids and seeing how many kids probably have their mouths open and how many kids have that are in there because of mouth breathing. And then you go talk to the orthodontist and you go, Hey, do you realize a lot of these kids have are breathing through their mouth? Can you do something about that? You're going to ask an orthodontist that's running 12 chairs, that's running how many bays to then start asking the parents about mouth breathing. Guys, this is a disruption in our workflow. This is not financially productive for a lot of doctors. And unfortunately, if you can't find the right doctors, you got to move the heck on. I'm sorry to say it. If you don't have the right doctors in the UK, you got to move on. And if your doctors aren't willing to come to a pediatric airway symposium, like I'm giving in Philadelphia, like all you guys who are on here, you better be in Philadelphia um, next April. You better, be, you better be there because there's going to be all the top minds in pediatric airway giving their take, giving their evidence on this stuff. And so I'm going to go to, to Nemours. I'm going to go to CHOP. I'm going to go to Christiana. I'm going to hand deliver these, 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 invitations to come hear, hear us speak on this stuff and hear, have our, um, our uh, doctors get educated. I mean, but if they don't choose to get educated, there's nothing you can do. You got to move on, man. You got to find the people that are special. <clears throat> All right. Good stuff. Uh, Ariel is kicking us off of here. Dental nachos. I, I'm sorry about that, Ariel. Uh, I was we're like, I just go. saw that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that, Ariel. All right, we're gonna go, guys. It was great for um, all of you guys. How do how do we uh, sign up for the get the emails for the seminar? Email me, John. Email me, Dr. Robinson at Pain and Sleep uh, Center. I'll get you on the email list. Okay. All right, guys. Be good. Uh, be well, and uh, see y'all back on uh, Tuesday for airway development with an airway orthodontist, Dr. Mariana Evans. See you guys next Tuesday. Bye.